um, our adaptive capacity and create a resilient future, ensuring that climate models capture these processes will underpin the capacity to predict changes with a greater confidence <laughs> and better understand uncertainties about future climate and there, uh, um, uh, thereafter advise um, accordingly on the appropriate uh, responses. Improved observation, pro uh, process understanding, and modeling of the climate system will deliver more robust information on timing, extent, uh, and the nature of the likely changes to temperature, rainfall, um, water availability, sea level, and extreme climate, climate events. And it is upon this um, premise that we are having this engagement uh, today. And we all acknowledge that it is never easy to deal with extreme events, hence this important uh, partnership. And um, uh, I'll now ask uh, Professor Stanley Nepazi to uh, do the opening address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pecha. Brilliant for 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 actually uh, giving us the, the 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 reasons why we are here today, and I would want um, actually to say some few words, but I think in particular uh, you have asked me to welcome uh, our our speakers and uh, uh, all the participants in this particular important uh, uh, webinar. I think it's uh, it's quite important uh, to have uh, a webinar of this nature or to discuss issues that are of this nature because um, we have seen um, a lot of suffering and we have seen a lot of struggles uh, that has affected uh, people's livelihoods. Uh, I mean, of course, maybe uh, for the for the people of the way of the Eastern Cape. Surely they're affected by both droughts as well as floods. But we've also seen also other Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, so we have seen also other areas in South Africa also affected by these extreme weather conditions. And of course, as uh, the, 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 the program director indicated, a lot of uh, climate-related kind of uh, issues that we have to deal with, some actually at a local level and some even at a broader or large-scale level. But I think, um, it may also be important for me before I go ahead to say some special welcome to our guests, special our speakers that are going to to speak today, especially honoring our 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 our, our event. So special welcome to the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro uh, and uh, Mr. Adam. We 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 all in the Dawars we have got uh, Dr. Adam. <laughs> Yeah, so you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome, sir. And I also want to indicate that our CEO actually would have wanted to be here, but because of um, governance um, uh, meetings, they, she's meeting with the board, and they are they are they're having a, a meeting which has actually clashed with this particular one. Surely she would have actually wanted to be here, but let me pass a uh, special greetings to you as well and at the special guests like Mr. Martin as well from Nelson Mandela Bay Metro as well. Yeah, actually, uh, Mr. Adam comes from the Nelson Mandela Bay Metropolitan uh, Municipality. Oh, no, 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 from the, what do you call that? Sorry. Yeah, from the organization called the uh, Mandela Bay Development Agency. Sorry about that. And also I want to welcome Dr. Museki as well. Uh, Dr. Museki used to work with us as well, and I know that he's with the Department of Water and Sanitation. Uh, yeah, Water and Sanitation. And he will also actually remind us about what um, the government and the department actually is planning on this 
imported issues relating to hydrological uh, uh, drought and uh, the perspective from the from climate change issues and and um, also i've seen actually that also professor Bega is here from northwest university welcome sir and uh, professor thank you professor jordan as well from ufs prof i hope you also talk about those scenario scenario planning actual uh, as well that you you talked about i think it was two or three years ago where you gave them different names it was actually exciting uh, that you talk about those scenario planning i'm not saying you should but i'm saying it was interesting that time because you were showing us different kind of um, of the future that we can actually choose for south africa in terms of water and even in terms of the farming community so it was actually interesting i'll remember that i remember that and we've got our own as well uh, dr kalivaile as well who will actually talk about um issues relating to 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 this what do you call the secular economy and the secular economy as well as alternative kind of uh, water sources uh, especially desalination that should actually be something very relevant and very useful especially for the cities and communities living closer to our oceans uh, like the the eastern cape and all those cities around them um, and we we also have dr adams as well as i talked about I, I I don't know why I've been I've been uh, um, uh, muted. Somebody muted me. I don't know when did I you last hear about me? Che? Brilliant. It's just it's less than one minute. Oh, okay, of course. Thank you, sir. Somebody muted me. Sorry, yeah. please don't mute me. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Adams as well. We'll talk about um. We'll pick it from we'll pick from what uh, Dr. Nonsan uh, Tlatikil will talk about, but talk about broad alternative water mix as well. And I'm seeing there's also a Professor Abidu as well from UCT. Thank you so much as well, talking about some of the issues relating to mitigation strategies as well. And um, and then we have got uh, Professor Mueller from VETS as well. So we would actually want to hear from all this spatial. Uh, 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 guest speakers and it's actually clear that we will hear different perspective in terms of the climate issues or things that uh, new research is showing us and even experiences and trends that we, we are seeing through research and through experiences and also we'll hear from uh, experiences and work that has been done on the field uh, from agricultural point of view from domestic water point of view and also from management point of view and, and and thank you so much for that so, so i thought i should actually say some few things relating to um our special guest is this occasion but um the last thing that i also want to talk about as a way also of welcome you colleagues is also maybe to to mention the point that we at the water research commission this is a very important um, subject for us because we know that climate and all the weather issues around that, they don't only affect the hydrological water cycle and our water resources and systems, but also affect livelihoods. And when things are not happening and when people actually are struggling, especially on uh, water security issues or, or threats, we as the Water Research Commission will always ask this question, question like, what are you doing about it? And if you don't have knowledge or you don't have uh, any availability of, uh, in terms of innovations or, 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 or tools that can be utilized, we are always asked why we didn't even think about it. So we will actually really depend much on you as our stakeholders, as you always know, in terms of new knowledge your experiences and so on but i'm also want to also to acknowledge the point that the presence of the municipality especially the 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 the, uh, the, the, the nelson mandela and also the agency will actually provide us with some of the practical 
examples in terms of challenges and also in terms of uh, uh, practical issues that they are having, which is going to inform the WRC program and also inform our future discussions with the researchers and you as our stakeholders in terms of the community of researchers so that we can always remain relevant and always uh, uh, fund and also manage appropriate research projects that actually our tax, tax uh, payers can realize the return on their investment because the WRC actually is funded fully by the levy or something like a tax, but call it the water levy. Uh, um, program director, uh, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'm certain that we are going to have fruitful discussions. We are going to learn there'll be new sites that will actually be, uh, be projected or will actually be articulated in this particular workshop. Thank you so much. Everybody, you're welcome. Feel free, participate. This is one of these the important organization where your ideas are always welcomed and are also accepted. Thank you very much, Program Director. Thank you very much, uh, Stanley, for a warm uh, welcome. Without of a waste of time, I will request uh, Ms. Debbie Hendricks to come and speak on behalf of the Mandela Bay uh, Development Agency. Good morning. Can everybody hear me clearly, see me clearly? Um, yes. Yeah, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to start by making an apology for our CEO, Mr. Ashraf Adam, is actually on the program this morning, but uh, he's on leave and um, he's asked me to stand in, which I'm very happy to do. This is a, a subject close to our hearts and as the MBDA, um, we are very keen to have platforms um, of discussion and engagement around issues that are of importance and, and pertinent to, to our city and our region specifically. So on the agenda, it says setting the scene of uh, the drought scenarios. And I didn't really want to, to speak too much on that, but maybe just focus on the role of the agency um, in this regard, because I think that is uh, clearly uh, the domain and ambit of, of the municipality. And I believe our colleague, Mr. Barry Martin, We'll, we'll cover the Port Elizabeth situation, um, what the the actual scenarios are, uh, what we are facing, um, and all the detail and technical aspects um, around the drought. But what I would want to say on behalf of the agency, as a as a co-host to, to this event, um, you know, so what is what is the agency's role? And maybe for those not in the know, if I could just take a minute to explain. Um, so the agency uh, of the municipality, we've been mandated to implement a number of strategic projects for the municipality. So uh, these, these include uh, our inner city areas, our beachfront tourism areas, uh, the Barkins Valley area, uh, Yutnaik Karicha area, which is our secondary urban node in the, in the metropole, um, township areas such as New Brighton, Shorterville, Corston and Helenville. Um, and these have been assigned as part of our uh, original establishment uh, brief by the municipality and have been added to over time with, with specific council resolutions designating <coughs> these areas. But in, in essence, we are owned by the municipality. They are our only shareholders. So, so we are um, at the behest of the municipality. We take our direction and our instruction from the municipality. Um, and, and being in local government, we are subject to all the, the legislative requirements of, uh, of local gov government, all the procurement issues, all the governance, governance issues, all the, the same uh, um, rules and regulations that applies, uh, that applies across the municipality applies to, to the agency. Currently, if I can just give you an idea, our, our mandate covers a range of, of, of matters. Um, from the provision and management of, of, of uh, projects and, and offering project management services. Uh, it also includes property management, property acquisition, facilities management. Uh, we do integrated development planning, um, a lot of community upliftment project type works, um, also pursuing the development goals of, of, the, of the city. 
Um, a large part of what we do entails research and, and knowledge creation, which is uh, what this morning is also about in, in terms of us um, uh, sharing information, knowledge, learnings around uh, um, the issues around the uh, water uh, shortages, water security, um, economic development, and then um, the maximizing of public and private assets. So you might ask yourself, so, so how does that um, relate to, to what we are doing? Um, you know, when people talk about the agency and development, automatically it's just seen as um, a project management company or a building company, if you like, for capital projects. That's what we have been in the past, but that, that is changing over time because our communities are telling us a different story that it's not just the brick and mortar um, aspects of development that has an impact. It's actually what we call the soft components, the psychosocial, the socioeconomic, the issues of gender and, and youth development, etc. Unless we bring those elements to the forefront of development, we actually have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Who are we developing for? So, so the issues around water, water security, is not a standalone, isolated uh, matter. It cannot be dealt with in isolation. So we are, um, as an agency, we are um, at the cusp of reviewing um, um, our, 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 our strategic plans, our long-term plans, to review what we have been doing and specifically what we need to be doing going forward. The agency was established in 2003. Um, that's, that's more or less when it started. But the agency of today in 2022, it's not the same. The city has changed. The needs have changed. And by far the most pressing strategic priority for the city at the moment is the water situation. So if it is that we need to revisit our plans going forward, we need to align with what the city's priorities are. If that's what the agency must do, um, that is something we have to take on board seriously. So I'm not saying um, let's throw out all the plans that we've had or the proverbial baby with the bath water. Sorry for the pun there. But some projects and activities that we had in mind certainly does not make sense when the overriding issue is water. Water is life. No matter what we plan, what we want to do, if there's no water, it just doesn't make sense. The crisis is also not a short-lived one. It is not like we will have good rains to, uh, you know, tomorrow and then the situation will return to normal. We've really been in this drought uh, to varying degrees since 2015. It is going to be our lives in the short, the medium and the long term. During the pandemic, uh, we all spoke about the new normal. But we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, with some sort of semblance of returning to normal life, you know, post-COVID. But, and that is, that is just two years into a pandemic. But if you look at the, the water crisis, it is actually a, a far worse situation. So the new normal approach would certainly have to be considered in, in, in relation to us being a, a, a water scarce region. We have to start living and planning for water shortages and for drought conditions uh, going forward. The realities of climate change is undeniable, and our responses need to address the oscillations of the extremes. Um, severe shortages, flooding, fires, um, the greatest threat to the city around water is actually the health perspective, the humanitarian perspective, the environmental perspective, and of course the economy. Just think about industries, education, schools, tourism. It is difficult not to get into a dark downward spiral about the effects this crisis will have on our communities. But the concerns are very deep and very real, and they have a knock-on and a multiply effect on all our activities. For example, you know, historically or, or, or colloquially, we used to use the term water security as meaning security of having a reliable source or a safe supply of water for all citizens. This might now even have some other connotations, some of them quite sinister. 
You know, the affluent can, can make choices where they can afford to buy bottled drinking water. But what about those in our community that don't have this option? There's already stories going around in our city of people stealing water from others. Jojo tanks in people's premises um, are, being, are being taken, um, hijacking of water tankers and trucks. Um, I re recently heard about a local story where people are collecting water from trucks that has been dispatched to a certain point during water shortages, where people are robbing, robbed from the water canisters and containers that they are carrying. And to share a little personal story uh, of my own, over a month ago, my house burnt down. And on the day, it was a real problem to get water to the premises, tiniest way to put the fire out. So this is not a far off issue. It becomes very personal to all of us and affects us, and it affects us now. I think sometimes we still, we are, we are lulled into a false sense of security because we can still open the taps and the water is still flowing. And maybe when there are cuts periodically, we sort of have a, a sense of, ah, oh, don't worry that it will be destroyed in a day or so. It just seems that the message of the dire situation is not getting through to us. As a development agency, we need to position ourselves to find solutions to development challenges. It has become clear that the most impoverished communities mm. For them, the socio-economic, psychosocial de uh, development matters are really? as, or really? if not more important than the infrastructure or the brick and mortar interventions. So as the agency, we've been asking ourselves, what do we do? You know, what is our strengths? What is it that we really do well? What skills and expertise can we bring to the table? Um, so our, we just, uh, in, our, in our preparation for our five-year plan, we, we sort of looked at these things carefully in terms of what we could offer. Um, social facilitation has become a particular strength of the agency in terms of community engagement, community empowerment, marketing and communications, events management, project planning, conceptualization um, of projects to the pre-feasibility, feasibility, business planning of both capital and non-capital projects, arts, culture, um, heritage activation, psychosocial intervention specifically focused on vulnerable groups, that being women, youth, and children, facilities and area management. We manage a number of facilities across the municipality, in, including the stadium, um, as well as the science center, another strong focus that we have been developing uh, over the last couple of years is partnership. The, the partnership with the Water Research Commission is an example that we see here today. But uh, key partnerships also in, in, in projects, but also in, in, in spaces of innovation and learning exchanges, partnering around shared uh, services, cross-beneficiation of interventions, building and fostering relationships and trust with partners over years. I mean, this takes uh, fostering and nurturing. Some examples um, uh, with the business chamber, the university, the automotive cluster, sustainable seas trust, as well as various uh, NGOs and NPOs that share our vision and our objectives for development for the city. We also do environmental management, research and innovation, and we've recently included climate change preparedness uh, to this component going forward. I think uh, in today's context, the issue or the element of knowledge management is, is what we are putting forward to say that there's a lot of lessons to be learned, but we're in a crisis now. So how do we how do we bridge the gap between uh, knowledge and and practice? Um, so the agency is positioned to pilot ideas and concepts, um, capturing and also documenting. Um, our learnings, sharing this information, applying what we've learned in one area, in other areas, hosting discussion platforms such as this, distributing information, and also um, uh, promoting education and awareness of uh, pertinent issues to the city. So, so in conclusion, we don't have a, a mandate specifically with the with the water situation in the city. It's a joint 
mandate. It's a joint responsibility with the city. We are availing our staff and our expertise, our experience to, to put shoulder to the wheel around the issues of water management. Um, it is going to be everybody's responsibility. We all have to play our part. Um, in today's webinar, in, in, in co-hosting this, this uh, session, uh, we want to take part in the spirit of, of saying, let's bring understanding, let's bring awareness, let's plan better, let's integrate our plans. Um, this is going to need an, an all hands on deck approach. So let, uh, let us avail ourselves to be part of the solution. Mr. Program Director, that is it from me. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. I will now request uh, Barry Martin to speak on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Metro, Nelson Mandela Bay Metro. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Program Director. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, a few uh, slides on the water situation. It's a bit difficult to cut everything down into a handful of slides. Uh, in the time limit that I've been provided with, just to give you an indication that I've presented the, the water situation to the citizens of the Metro through an online um, uh, meeting as well. And the presentation was 45 minutes long. So you can appreciate how much I had to cut down and just put a slightly different perspective on this matter because also um, this is caused by our Water Research Commission colleagues and obviously they have also got an interest in how to take these matters forward in terms of the bigger picture of things. So just to give you an indication of some statistics of the municipality, just under 2,000 square kilometers of area, 1.2 million people, uh, about uh, 277,000 households. We've got a very large indigent household uh, um, uh, 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 component and with high unemployment, uh, these are uh, areas that we have uh, facing us and obviously with COVID also increasing that unemployment rate. We have coverage of access to water throughout the municipality, formal areas 100% and in informal areas the um, as access via standpipes or communal tanks and there's a sanitation backlog that we are still uh, looking at addressing especially in the newly established informal settlements and we have a staff complement of about 7,000 employees. Just to take us back in history and time, our major, probably our first uh, water resource that was developed more than 100 years ago was the San and the Balk River uh, system. The, this system is actually consists of about four dams, very small, and they only uh, represent about 1% of the metropolitan water supply. Then we have the Grundal uh, Dam, feeding the uh, uh, town of Kariga, uh, previously known as Utrenek. And um, that also, uh, with a development that is only f uh, feeding a portion of, of the town. The historic uh, main water supply to the metro has been the Churchill and Imporfu dams located on the Krom River. And that is where we get uh, historically most of our water from. The Luri uh, uh, system is fed from the Koha Dam into the Luri Balance Dam, and then from there we get water as well. That Luri Koha system is we share it with the irrigators, the agricultural community, and they uh, have about access to 75% of that water, and we have 25% of access license to the NMBM. Then the feed from the north, which comes about 450 kilometers uh, from the Kharib Dam. Um, into the Skeperslakte balancing dam and then uh, treated at Noitgedacht and then pumped into the city from, from that northeastern side. Then there are the uh, natural springs at Kariga uh, that is providing about six megs of water per day and the groundwater that we are developing at Kuchakop uh, that will develop uh, 15 megs per day in a couple of months from now. So just to give you an indication of the current dams, those, that is what the dams look like. The percentages are about one or two percent different, but they are still in a very precarious situation. You'll notice here the Imporfu Dam 
Uh, this is probably the lowest that it's been since it was constructed in 1984. Um, so it is it's not in a good state at, at all. Um, this is of particular concern, uh, this photograph that we took. Um, we actually uh, fly drones over the dams just to check on, on what is happening. And this red uh, line, which is, looks like a squiggle, actually depicts the end of the, the water uh, edge as it's receding, as the dam level is dropping. And this point over here, it's about uh, 10 kilometers below the Churchill Dam. Uh, the dam wall, and it's on the Krom River as well. The Churchill and Impofu Dam is on the same river system. And as this line recedes, it's only 1.3 kilometers away from the intake tower. So we are, haven't got much water left in this dam before we actually run dry. And that prediction is that it is four to six weeks from now. Normally, the water would flow in if the dam is at about 16%, flow into the intake tower there and get pumped in there. But it hasn't been at 16% for a couple of years now. And therefore, these, uh, these barges have been floated there. There are pumps on them. And we pump the water into the intake tower to, to feed uh, into the treatment works where the water is treated and then pumped via that pipeline uh, to, into the metropolitan area. The Koha and the Nipofu Dam are our biggest dams and they uh, supply about 81% of the water. And you'll notice the smaller dams on the right there, although they're municipally owned, they are very small. And then the, uh, they also just make up a small portion of the water. Uh, as, and there's the Luri Dam that is uh, located on the Koha River as well. Uh, this slide is of particular concern because although the dam capacity is sitting at 12.35%, in fact, this morning, um, when we take what we call the dead storage out of it, meaning the water that we can't take out of the dam via the normal means, we sit with less than 2% of water available that we can take out of the dam. And calculating that 2% in how much it is in terms of volume and how many days we have left, we have about 22 days of water storage left, and that'll take us uh, to mid-June, basically, before the dam starts running dry one after the other. So what is our dilemma that we sit, sit with as, as, a, uh, as a learning in environment? Our current water uh, supply mix is made up of surface dams, natural spring and a water transfer system. The dilemma that we sit with is that every four to five years we have been in a drought. Um, not as severe as this one, certainly not. not. And the water yields from all the dams have been allocated, so there's no additional water that we can take from any dam because all they are fully, what we call allocated means licensed, and the Department of Water and, and Sanitation issue those licenses, and that's based on the safe yield, which means the safe volume that can be taken out consistently from the dam. When we looked at all the resources that is allowed to the municipality, and based on the license ex extractions that we can take from those various resources, we actually have an available water uh, storage uh, with Noitgedacht uh, being f will be finished at the end of June, although we have access to the majority of that 209 uh, uh, megalitres per day. We have a total yield available to the municipality of 410 megalitres per day. And that volume is obviously significantly higher than what the current average of 280 is. However, all these dams are not full, and therefore we sit with a dilemma of the current uh, water shortage that we have. So in under normal rainfall conditions, and where dams would fluctuate and fill and lower drop down to 30 or, or 40 or 50 percent, and then fill up during the rainy season again, we will have access to that 410 uh, uh, megalitres per day, which support economic development, basic water needs and, and the like. But uh, uh, the drought situation changes that picture. So we have to have what we look at the water mix. So when you look at those uh, eight areas, they can be divided into three areas in predominantly. Surface water, which is 48%, the natural spring, which is 1%, and the Noitgedag transfer system, which is 51%, of the 410 megalitres per day. However, 
The Neukredacht is also surface water because it come out of a dam, but it's a dam that is uh, that through a transfer system. That's why uh, it is noted in in that fashion. So, as I indicated, we're sitting with a drought of every four to five years, and this is an extract from our South African Weather Services, where they've indicated the rainfall history going back to the year 1900. And these are the main circles are the periods of below average rainfall that has, that has occurred and where substantial uh, uh, water shortages were experienced. Now there was a period, a period between 1984 and 1992 when the, uh, we experienced a very long period of, of drought. Although we're only in year seven now, and that was a 12 year period, that period was uh, did not have the connectivity of uh, the communities that we have currently uh, and the population that we have currently. So the, uh, uh, the city's makeup and the supply of water is vastly different to that period of 30 years ago. Just to look at, at the dam levels, that was the rainfall. Yeah, when looking at the dam levels, you will notice that the the 88 period, the to the 92 period, um, in fact, around the uh, uh, the 99 to 2000, there was also a period of below average rainfall, and then 2005, 2010, and now again since 2015, uh, 2016, we have had below average rainfall, and the dams uh, uh, reacted and had to drop significantly. And you can see that the lowest rainfall year in 2020, that it's spiking at the lowest point to which the dams have receded as a result of that rainfall, low rainfall. This is the average dam levels for the last 20 years. What has been highlighted in particular is the dam level since 2015 when the dams were last full and each year how it's, how it's responded. You'll see in 2018 that yellow graph there, it spiked up in September because of the good rains that we had there. But since then, there's been a steady decline to 2021 when we had that period of the lowest average dam levels in the history of, of the municipality. And coupled to, to that, uh, the current year 2022 is on the same trajectory as, as well. So how do we bridge this gap of, of, of droughts and, and negative cycles? Because that's our topic for today. So the current drought is stretching for seven years already. We have, and the regular droughts have a negative impact on our community. And the seven years, last seven years has obviously been compounded by COVID. Um, but the, the, the society, society confidence in the NMBM to supply basic water is as one of those negative Im Im impacts that we sit with. The, the economic impact to concurrent businesses, do they feel confident to exp actually expand their businesses, especially if they are uh, water intensive businesses? The inability to attract, in fact, more businesses to grow the economy, uh, improve, uh, create op uh, employment opportunities, and then reduce poverty as well. And with that basic water requirements for everybody. And so this is what the negative impacts that these prolonged and regular droughts could have. So the, the solution that I'm promoting here is we have to improve the water supply mix and, and we need to diversify so that when, when one area is, is struggling, we can back it up with, it, with another supply. So our water mix options are obviously surface water. There's a transfer scheme uh, that I've referred to. There's groundwater, which is natural springs, balls. And obviously, balls might seem uh, as an easy, easy process, but there is much research uh, going into a borehole for a municipal supply for commu communities uh, versus a ball just for domestic use uh, uh, in your or even for a single business use for that matter. So your and then we're also looking at wastewater recycling. Uh, most of the wastewater from our biggest plant is dedicated to the Kuha. Uh, SEZ in terms of their uh, environmental authorization that they must use uh, um, industrial wastewater, uh, uh, industrial water for their industrial purposes. Uh, we're looking at currently there's irrigation being water being used at the golf courses and the university. And then obviously the long term is then to uh, 
turn the wastewater, uh, recycled wastewater into drinking water in, term, in the long term. And then there's all. So when we look at this mix uh, uh, to improve our water supply to the metro, uh, items one to eight reflects the 410 megaliters per day that I've just uh, referred to. Then there's a period of item nine and 10 that refers to 45 megaliters per day, of which the first 15 is for the Kucha desalination plant, which is under review at the moment. Um, apparently, tenders have closed for the Kucha, for Kucha, and they're still looking at the final funding model and the agreements for, for that contract. But apart from, from that, in terms of the balls that are listed there, those that 30 megalitres per day identified there, although the future availability would indicate that it's in two years, we will actually bring that uh, on stream at the latest by December, uh, not December, by September 2022. You will also notice that the balls at Churchill has not been developed yet. That is under development, uh, will be the next phase of development after we deal with the current uh, ball projects that we would like to complete first. Then long term after that, we will look at uh, obviously your de a bigger diesel plant at school microscope and more research into the wastewater recycling, as I've indicated earlier on, then also up to drinking water standards, and then bringing that additional water, uh, uh, groundwater in as well uh, at 17 megs per day, taking our total future water demands in the next five to 10 years up to 600 megalitres per day, which is basically double the average water consumption uh, uh, currently. And that mix changes uh, the picture substantially from a 50% local mix and a 50% transfer mix to surface water dropping to 32%, our Neukredag supply to 35, groundwater nine, uh, wastewater recycled water basically will be 13% and desalinated seawater 12%. This is an extract from our reconciliation strategy that is conducted by the Department of Water and Sanitation. Uh, um, they are in the review of this document at the moment, but here is um, uh, a, a dilemma that we sit with here that we're looking at, at desalinated seawater as an add-on in the future. And I believe that as a country, we have to look at desalination of seawater substantially different, especially in light of our cl climate change challenges, especially in light of regular droughts that we actually have here. Uh, my view is that actually we need to change that desalination of seawater approach, that the desalinated seawater will actually become your baseline water supply, and that your dam, your surface water supply, would be the fluctuation component on top of that meaning that your, your, when you take your run it on baseline like that, then should a drought occur, the volume of water that's in the dam will be able to ride us through those dry periods. And this is what uh, we as the Metro is going to put forward for the reconciliation strategy that's under discussion at the moment, that you can model it along those lines and come up with a, a different view. Uh, um, there are other views uh, of, of also giving up licenses for agriculture as well, but I think that is probably an area for different discussion. But the, to indicate that in a nutshell is to basically we give up our rights to all our surface water and we build a big, a big desalinated sea plant and feed uh, the municipality with, with that. And then all the water in the dams and stuff like that go for agriculture, food security, poverty to, uh, alleviation and the like. So when we bring this into context of managing the water, uh, so we have to reflect on our planning documents. Our integrated development plan that is currently being drafted or finalized for that matter for the next five years, uh, obviously highlights the needs of the, uh, the communities, the plans of the municipality and how we're going forward. Then in support, one of the sector plans that's developed for that is the water service development plan that is required in terms of the uh, um, uh, the relevant act. But also that plan identifies the shortcomings of, of the water uh, supply system as it is currently uh, um, being experienced. 
and that plan in total is used as input into our water master plan, which will look at not only the planning for the next five years, but for, for the next uh, uh, basically 10 to 20 years uh, going ahead. Uh, so which will take us virtually beyond, beyond at least something up to 2050, because that's probably would be a, a more tangible and a longer t uh, planning horizon, bearing in mind that uh, um, uh, if you need to build a dam, that takes you about 15 years to build. So just to put it into timelines, into context as well. And then obviously a, a, a very crucial element in dealing with water is also your non-revenue water plan. How do you deal with your water on a day-to-day basis and manage that? Just to give an indication of the plan of the municipality, we have developed a uh, 15 work streams and it's in a, in a 10 year plan approved by council that identified these various areas of activity that we must actually work on on, in, on a day to day basis and fixing a leak or repairing a pipe or managing a demand zone. It's not a once of ex exercise. These 15 work streams is actually the lifeline of the water business of the municipality. And it is not going to stop today or tomorrow. As long as there is water to be provided to the community, we have to address all of these uh, matters at the same time on a regular basis. Just to look at, at water usage and water demand, obviously we're in a drought at the moment and we're encouraging our customers to use from domestic point of view, 50 liters per person per day. And with a four person household, you need to use about six kiloliters per month. However, just to put it in terms of a water management point of view, the international norm is to supply water, uh, use water about 150 liters per person per day. And that obviously includes all activities. These, the 50 liters that I refer to here is more for personal use. The 150 that I refer to obviously allows for certain activities like even gardening and the like uh, 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 at our households. However, our average water consumption is over 200 liters per person per day. And um, that is a paradigm shift that we as a whole country need to go through. And I think our colleagues at the uh, Water Research Commission have got far more, far more accurate uh, uh, numbers of the per capita water usage in our country. But this is the norm that we have to go on. Debbie has referred to the new norm. For us being water wise, not only now during the drought, but all the days of our life, basically, we have to stick to these things and uh, and to prevent us landing up from a drought, uh, a crippling drought every four to five years. And obviously we have to look at our resource management, water management, I have to look at our available resources, staff, finance and plant and equipment. I've just lifted them there and each of these elements in its own has got the potential of having a lecture on its own virtually. But this is just to indicate that it's a complete value chain when dealing with water management. You can have planning as much as you want, but you must look at the hardcore stuff, people that you need to employ to achieve those goals, the funding model to fund your, uh, your, your programs and plans, and then the maintenance of plant and equipment, which is basically our infrastructure, uh, uh, just your water and sanitation network together. Those two is about 8,000 kilometers long in the metro, and there's about 90 sewer pump stations, uh, 60 uh, reservoirs, about 30, 40 water pump stations, and 14 water and wastewater treatment works. So that element is substantial, and the asset values is, is, is uh, probably close to 20 billion rand. So it's a very vast business to manage, and that's why I say each of these elements will take quite a substantial discussion. Um, there was a, uh, an element in our program that is also referred to uh, protecting our infrastructure. And vandalism, our infrastructure, is a, a huge area of our concern. So certain installations, we have to have security at them 24-7. We have bulk inspectors who drive along our bulk lines, check that there's no vandalism taking place, but your eyes and ears can't be all over. And your, um, we're actually changing, you know, the previous that we have uh, telemetry with um, uh, aerials and things like that sticking up in the air. The 
today's society, you can't allow that metal wires and pipes sticking up above ground. So that all that technology is changing now to more modern technology where you can put a transducer underneath the concrete basically and it can transmit, transmit information for us. And some of that information we just track on our cell phones also now these days. And we've, our guys have gone as far as to put sensors into manholes. And um, the picture on the left is typically that happened a, a, couple, of, a couple of months ago. Um, on the right hand side there is just typically the vandalism that happens. People shift the mantle covers, it drops into the mantle and it breaks a pipe and you sit with a huge problem. Uh, the gentleman there on the left hand side is not breaking into the mantle. He was actually tense, testing the sensor which is located under the cover of the mantle. So if he thumps the mantle or he would knock like a chisel on, the, on there, it would send uh, a pick, the sensor would pick up a signal and it will uh, send it to the maintenance team and to indicate that they're stamping on our manholes. Also, the lockable covers and the like have been developed that we use. But also, the, one of the latest is, is a light sensor. So if you move the manhole cover and daylight comes into the cover, it, it indicates that light and then it uh, sends over a signal to us as well. So just in conclusion, we sit in a drought of every four to five years. And some of the areas that I've discussed uh, is trying to bridge that drought, especially how to approach with desalinization of seawater. Sea there is much resistance uh, from some funding houses in the country not to support desalination of seawater uh, because of its price. But I believe strongly that if you manage it correctly and it fit, fits into the proper water mix, it can form a very critical part of uh, bridging uh, our effects of droughts that we are currently uh, experiencing as, as, as well. But also the key elements of dealing with non-revenue non water can't be uh, um, uh, minimized in this equation. To me, planning remains the key in everything that, that you, uh, you have to do. And we need to have a paradigm shift in how we view desalinization of seawater. Sea we have to see how it comes into the water mix. To me, it's a new resource of water. It's not a uh, water resource is normally referred to water in a dam that you treat from the, there. But the sea is an unlimited uh, uh, water resource for us. The only problem is just more expensive to treat. And there we need a paradigm shift in how we view that uh, in this country as well. And therefore, the idea of a base water supply system, as I referred to. Water businesses need to be reinvested so that it can be be sustainable on its on its own. Uh, it is very critical in in the in the supply of water services uh, to its communities. And as I indicated, non-revenue water is a reflection of the daily activities within the water business. And uh, the funding reinvesting uh, of the water business and ability to deal with non-revenue water is then via a close element of working together. And to reduce the water use uh, per capita it has to be a permanent way of life going forward. Thank you, Chair. That is my presentation. Thank you very much, um, Barry. We, we now have um, for time for questions to um, the previous speakers. Um, you can either raise up your hand and some questions can be posted in the chat and then you can get uh, immediate response uh, there. Thank you very much. Um, that was quite uh, comprehensive. Um, Andres, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Barry, the water coming from the Harib Dam what is the problem? Why did the metro wait so long before they increase uh, supply from the Harib Dam? Because I see currently the Harib Dam is 98%. So uh, uh, what went wrong that we, I, I mean, the, the metro knew long before the time that because of population change, because of economic development in the metro, they will run out of water during a drought. So, so why didn't they increase the water supply from the Harib Dam uh, much earlier? Uh, 
Are we going to take all the questions first? I don't see another hand. Please uh, respond, and then we can have a follow-up, uh, another question thereafter. Uh, the planning for the water from the Kharib Dam has always been on the cards, and, and it dates back to uh, the original scheme that was developed in came stream on stream in 1992, approximately. And um, it has to do with timing and funding and the like as well, and uh, obviously the contractual uh, arrangements. Unfortunately, there was a huge contractual dispute on this contract uh, that um, took about a, more than a year to resolve. And that's one of the reasons that there was a bit of delay in the implementation of, of this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bonan. Thanks, thanks, brilliant. I just want to check with uh, Barry <coughs> uh, on the issue of uh, monitoring, uh, particularly um, this the catchment that I've just walked through is Barnes, uh, there by your building uh, from from the estuary all the way to the top. Um, I was just wondering if there is uh, one. Um, any monitoring happening in that system, um, uh, water quality and water quantity. Uh, so I'm talking about wares, gauging wares and water quality as, as, as it is uh, broadly. Um, and who is doing that? Where is that data? Um, I would also like to know about the, um, in your integrated monitoring plan, I did not hear much about alien invasive plants, control and management. That catchment is heavily um, infested with uh, alien invasive plants. Whereas in the upper reaches, which is your sponges, uh, where your, your water um, towers really is, naturally so what is happening with the clearance of alien versus plants um then the other aspect is around what they be raised a bit earlier talk about people you know taking water illegally from somewhere and uh, i i just wanted to check if there's any um illegal water uh, abstractions that are happening in the Panes uh, river as well um, um, lastly, uh, you talk about desalination. From the ecological point of view, we always worry about um, the brand, uh, what you do with the concentrated salt, uh, that will be the waste product of desalination. Thanks, Brian, that is a lot already. Thank you, uh, Jay. Yeah, look, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, questions we can ask. But I think let's look at solutions. One of the gap I find, and you know, listening to a lot of presentations, is that uh, you know Port Elizabeth, uh, within this challenge and and previously has a drawdown problem. Okay, uh, the user consumption is not reflecting the kind of stress the system is under. Now you know we uh, in the in the Cape Town intervention. We struggle to get the officials to re re recognize behavior change, uh, you know, as a key intervention measure. You know, it came on very, very late. There was too many technical interventions, people thinking that technology can solve all the aspects. And, and the behavioral elements came to the savior of Cape Town towards the end when it was reaching those kind of peaks. So, you know, we've developed, you know, some very new tools around, you know, behavioral nudges, et cetera, that I feel, you know, that the city can start using and incorporating that, uh, you know, it positions itself to deal with the current crisis, but also starts planning to deal with the future operational issues around the kind, uh, kind of large drawdowns you're getting from the system that is not designed, uh, you know, to, to absorb those large drawdowns because of the changes in population dynamics and those kind of things. So, you know, we have the, 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 the reports. Uh, we can connect you uh, with the teams at UCT uh, to, to see how they can 
you know, help with your own comms teams, etc., to bring all of these new caveats into your arsenal that we can have sort of uh, quick uh, behavioral uh, changes through the changes in how uh, we use the uh, instruments and other. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Barry, you can respond. Uh, thank you very, very much um, for the questions. Um, monitoring of water quality and quantity. Um, uh, we obviously, the Department of Water and Sanitation uh, monitors uh, the dam levels. They have to do independent monitoring on that. And with that, obviously, it monitors the amount of water that we take out of the dams. We obviously also keep our records of the daily water consumption and how much the dams are reducing by as water is used or as the dam would fill up with the rain also. And obviously water quality monitoring in terms of drinking water after the treatment after the treatment of treatment of water that we report to on ultimately on the um, the DWS IRS uh, uh, online system. So that's where we report on the water quality. But we'd also do regular uh, uh, testing as uh, required in terms of uh, once or twice a year in terms of testing our raw water. Uh, but it's an, something that we are starting to have a look at and see if we wouldn't test the raw water uh, more often uh, than, uh, than, than is required. On alien vegetation, in fact, we actually had to stop our alien vegetation uh, removal currently because we actually ran out of funds. We actually cleared about 170 hectares of alien vegetation in the Crom uh, in, in the Crom River catchment area. So that is predominantly where we are. And obviously, uh, also bearing in mind that uh, the Churchill Dam is a uh, is is owned by the municipality, but the other dams are all state-owned dams. So the management of the catchment obviously would reside with that sector department. Then on the illegal uh, abstraction of water, where we find illegal abstraction of water, even within the metropolitan boundaries, uh, we have our metropolitan police, our metro police with us, and they we actually issue fines in terms of the bylaw should uh, people transgress those those uh, those um, those bylaws. On the desalinization of seawater, obviously the first prize of is to reuse the brine actually for another purpose. So that uh, that is um, first prize. But uh, at the desalinization of seawater at the um, at Schoolmarker Scop, we actually used the local university who did the um, seawater monitoring for us for at, at least about a 12 month period. Uh, looking at the uh, salinity, the temperature, uh, tides and the like. And because of the, the location of the plant, it's on a very rocky coast there. The modeling of the um, dissemination of the salt plume uh, will be instantly. And so there won't be a need for a long uh, uh, outlet pipe from the uh, from the plant in back into the sea to to put that water in there and it will be just into the surf zone, if I can call it, where it breaks onto the rocks. And th that is where it indicated that it will disseminate quite uh, quite quickly. Yes, the behavioral change is something we've already started looking uh, looking at and our local university has also come up with, with plans on that. But um, uh, if you mind sharing that with us uh, at, of the University of Cape Town, we can have a look at that and just compare the notes and see which are the best way of, of tackling that. It is an, an element that we started looking at be, beforehand or already, but uh, you know, behavioral change uh, must, must also be driven at all fronts. Uh, an area typically that we have to do is, um, it's actually for a while that I've been considering this, is to look how we can reintroduce that very vigorously at at, uh, at primary school level actually um, to go back to the basics at those levels to to reinculcate the the seriousness of water uh, thank you uh, chairperson thank you very much um, i also acknowledge the um, solutions that are recommended in in the chat put by monde um, now i would like to request um, uh, 
uh, Dr. Museki from Department of Water and Sanitation to come and talk to us about the hydrological perspectives. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, oh, try and fly to this. I hope can maybe someone fly to the presentation from your side. <laughs> Thank you. Otherwise, I'll try. I'm doing it uh, brilliant. I, I hope it's OK. Uh, can you please uh, display the uh, presentation? OK, let me just take off. Really, is it showing? Not yet. I tried to share. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Manny Penny. Can you can you place it at um, presentation mode? Presentation mode, please. Thank you. Okay. I'm trying to do that. First, just to say that the slides that I'm gonna use were developed by other people, and I only picked them up to convey my thoughts on hydrological perspective in the management of water under a changing climate, under human induced impacts, and of course under climate variability such as drought. Um, uh, apologies for, for not citing many of them um, appropriately. Uh, I'm just going to provide a national view of water situation in South Africa with a focus on, 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 on response strategies. Um, can we get to the next slide, please? Um, our source, of course, uh, of water is its rainfall. And when one looks at the long term monthly uh, rainfall, you can see in winter, I mean, in summer now, that uh, which areas are actually um, um, wet or where we, we, we have a lot of rainfall. And then in winter, uh, in the in the areas like uh, the Western Cape, uh, which is the winter we, 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 winter season um, sort of sort of area, um, can we get to the next slide, please? Yeah, water is actually unevenly distributed in South Africa. You can see uh, if you look at, for example, rainfall. We, we, we all know this famous slide which on the spatial distribution that the rainfall is actually decreasing as you go westwards and increasing as you go towards the east. Out of the total runoff of 49,000 um, million cubic meters of water. Um, sorry, I'm actually hidden by, the, by this thing. Reliable yield available, it's, 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 it's 21%, not 27% of total runoff. And the remaining development potential, of course, is 11%. And uh, potential reuse and uh, of return flows, it's, it's about 4%. Can you go to the next slide? And for groundwater, um, Again, <laughs> similar to surface water, there the, the, the seems to be um, more groundwater as you go towards the east as, as expected, because uh, those are the areas where you have a lot of rainfall and hence recharge. Now, when you look at the mean annual potential recharge of 21,000 uh, cubic meters per annum, we have the mean annual contributions to, to the rivers, which um, is it's usually called base flow, although much of it is actually interflow. Um, it's, it's about 23% of the, manual, the, 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 the mean annual potential recharge. And you tell, you, 
utilizable groundwater exponential potential is 36%, and the current use is 40%, which leaves us with 60% of, 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 of potential development. And, and what will it take? It will take uh, funding, it will take appropriate um, uh, assessment, because in most cases we drill boreholes, and in some cases we look for groundwater using a, a drilling machine. But if we do really appropriate um, assessment, uh, we can we can double even the current usage of, of groundwater. I'm talking nationwide. Next slide. And of course, uh, the precipitation uh, just click again. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not controlling the slides. Uh, and again, yes, uh, the spatial distribution um, of, 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 of precipitation. You can see uh, in that map on the spatial distribution map on the on the left hand side, you can see the light blue color, which is surface water where it occurs. This is the strategic water source area map, which was developed by the Water Research Commission and of course in collaboration with the CSIR and other partners. And, and then of course for groundwater, you can see the turquoise um, map, which shows where groundwater occurs and the deep blue is it's where both occurs. But now uh, this South Africa's average monthly temperature and rainfall map at the top. And then of course at the bottom, we show the, the Western Cape winter rainfall. Next, next slide. Uh, yeah, the that same map which is on the right on the left side shows that half of our water resource, of course, originate from less than 10% of the land. What does this mean? This means that these high yielding areas are vulnerable and, and, and should be monitored and protected to limit um, potential land use impacts as well as climate change impacts. Next slide. Um, of course, Barry indicated that the department is, is, is monitoring the water levels. Um, I do not have yet have this week's um, 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 uh, provincial dam average water level, but I think last week's levels would, would, would do. Um, last week level in, um, in, in red compared to the, the, the week before in blue, you can see uh, for example, for the Eastern Cape in particular, that um, it is actually uh, Eastern Cape and Western Cape are on average are, are the lowest, whereas the rest of the country has uh, its level is very high. Next slide. And then uh, if you can see those small dots indicate uh, the status of, of surface water storage. And much of the country is blue, except for the, if you look near Port Elizabeth and much of the Eastern Cape, and as you go towards the west, and a little bit up north there as well, that uh, we have uh, very low, low storage. Uh, next slide. Now, um, much has been spoken about the, the water services, uh, water and sanitation services uh, reliability. And, and again, uh, the Eastern Cape has, has, has the lowest uh, reliability in terms of water supply and sanitation services. Uh, it is not always that water comes out of the tap. And of course, uh, admittedly, um, it's not only due to, due to climate change, I might say, uh, even our management, I'm talking countrywide, White. Mismanagement also um, can be a contradictory factor, and there are other factors as well. And uh, it's not only climate change. Climate change does you can attribute things to climate change, but I, I might say as we as we are talking today, we're talking climate variability. We're talking drought. Um, uh, the normal drought is to blame, but also. Uh, the, the misuse. Uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Barry indicated that the behavioral change must be at all fronts, uh, which means um, even <laughs> users are often forgotten. Uh, and as we as we tackle government, which is the right thing to do in terms of providing water and in, in, in the leadership, but I seldom hear anybody shouting at the users and saying the users should do that. And, 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 and I must add that if you look at California, for example, in terms of the non-revenue water, and you look at Australia as the non-revenue 
water is around 10% or less compared to 41% or more in South Africa. Yet, those two, uh, the country, um, uh, well, California is, 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 is uh, it's not a country, it's a region, but um, it's, it's, they have a similar climate, they have similar challenges, water challenges uh, in terms of climate and so on. Where is the problem? I think part of the problem is not only management, is that the users there are coming, uh, you know, are also, are also see themselves as part of the solution and not just lining up shouting and saying, I need water. It's interesting that when it comes to money in South Africa, we don't say to the Minister of Finance, print more money, but with water, we think uh, supply is the only, is the only uh, um, uh, solution. And, and uh, so it's very important when it comes to water conservation for all of us to put our hands on the deck. Next slide. Next slide, please. Penny. Next slide. We're now getting into the, the response strategy for enhanced water security. Yes, um, the National Water and Sanitation Master Plan it's 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 guiding us when it comes to what we need to do in order to turn around the situation. Uh, I think everybody is familiar with the sanitation master plan. Next slide. And next slide. I think there's a slide that uh, that 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 have that I have skipped that have that I have skipped there that is on the um, no 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 go up go up stay stay with me stay with me with the previous one yes this one um, that the climate change strategy um, has also been uh, response strategy has also been developed by the department and of course it's aligned to the national water master plan and other documents uh, at the regional and at uh, national level um, that are act that actually aims to manage to ensure management of of, of, of water under climate change and uh, through in appropriate interventions and also to promote iwrm uh, as as a tool to reduce climate variability vulnerability including of course extreme events and, and droughts and floods and so on next slide yes uh, strategic interventions i think this is the most important slide for, for, for the message that I just want to convey uh, since I do not have much time. Um, water conservation and demand management is very, very key. It's very important. It's very cheap compared to uh, developing a scheme. And it can be done, it can actually be, 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 be dealt with by everybody. Even the small, the little child would not leave the tap, the tap running. We, we, we have to really manage our use. But that use man, cannot be managed by the department. Just like the money in your pocket, you manage it yourself. You don't ask the Minister of Finance to manage it. Please let us all manage our water that is um, um, th that we have, that we have been licensed to use. Whether you are a municipality, whether you are a householder, it doesn't matter where you are. We all, I think, South Africa needs to, to start to understand that we all have to be part of the solution. Otherwise, we will shout as much as we can. We will not, I don't think we'll ever be able to, to get out of the mess in which we are if we, we only uh, focus on government. It's important we have to call government to account, but at the same time, we have to also introspect and look at ourselves. And the other thing, which of course Barry talked to, expand water mix by increasing the the use of groundwater, uh, reuse and desalination. I like Barry's presentation. He made it very clear that um, groundwater needs to be in order for you to really be able to use it. There has to be optimal assessment and there has to be scientific approach that has to be used. Also optimize the operation of the existing systems, including groundwater operating not tools but 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 rules uh, this is a tipo uh, um, in other words uh, once the boreholes well fields have been drilled i think it's very important for us to to um, to keep to the to the to the safe field so to speak interbasin transfer from where there's a lot of water to where water is needed. Improvement of water quality, very important, and implement the surface water and groundwater resource development. Next slide, please. Yes, 
water conservation and demand management. I think Barry has talked a lot to this thing, uh, leak, de leak detection, pressure management, and so on. And there you have it now. The status is currently, um, when I say currently, I mean as, as, uh, two years ago, I'm not sure uh, whether there has been a study to date now uh, on on where we sit, but we are now um, in terms of what is published, sitting as 41 um, uh, percent average in terms of the non-revenue water. Uh, there is a large goal to reduce the water losses and so on. Next slide. Yes. There's a need for diversification of the water resource mix to ensure water resilience. On the left hand side, we have our current water resource mix, but we actually aim to ensure that reliance on surface water reduces from 77% to 63% by 2040, while the groundwater from 14% to 18% through assessment that I talked about. And of course, also reused, also desalination, uh, return flows, you reuse and so on. Yes. Next slide. Uh, water resource major infrastructure planning horizons. Um, it's we, we the department undertakes various planning studies over a period of 25 years horizon to ensure water security for the country. Currently, obviously, our planning outlook is for 2050. Although we are in 2022, so for the next 25 years plus, we 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 we, we have planned for that. Now, if you plan, of course, one has, when you plan a dam, you plan it forever. But 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 one must be mindful of the fact that then you have uh, uncertainties increases and that's why every now and then you have to revisit and, and do some adjustments and so on monitor and uh, readjustments next slide uh, and then of course reconciliation studies uh, are being undertaken uh, on key large water resource systems overlaying on a map showing the economic uh, growth areas uh, countrywide after we have done these reconciliations, then we hand over to, to design and so on. Next slide. Yeah, uh, understanding the reconciliation uh, strategy, just click a little bit. Mm -hmm. Click once, please. Yes. Uh, no, 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 no. Don't be too fast. Okay. Now, um, where you have a right there is where the supply exceed the uh, the demand. Uh, but the next, if the supply is less than the demand, then it's not good. Then you need to 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 undertake some interventions in order to to do the balance. Next, let's click again. Uh, and of course, uh, you either you have to address the demands or address the supply. Actually, uh, ideally, you need to do both in order to, 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 to address the situation. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, the water balance. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Fine, yeah, no, 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 that's fine. It doesn't matter. You can click. Okay. okay. Uh, but but leave it leave it at that yes uh, so the water is is taken from as i said earlier from where there's there's much water to where there is less water just as you can see there um on the on the right um on on the right hand side um, i'm not sure whether you can see my 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 mouse you can see that um the requirements is far less than the uh, available here in this area, but here the requirements is more than the available. So you need to transfer water from that end to that end. These arrows here are showing the transfers. Um, click again. Click on the slide or? Uh, just, just, just arrow down, arrow down. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Then you can see um, the, 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 the projects, the development of major water resource projects throughout the country. The green, of course, shows where um, the, 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 the planning has been has been completed. And, and we have given this now to the design and, and the blue is where it's under implementation. It's not completed, but it's under implementation. And of course, the red is where we are still we are still busy uh, doing the planning. In, in different countries. You'll, you'll, you'll get these slides, I, I, I guess, they'll be given to you and you can be able to see this yourself. I do not want to take much time now. Next slide. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not going to go through the whole slide, but this is just uh, an example of the recommended action plan. Water conservation and water demand management, where we, we, we reduce the loss uh, of water, I mean, the, the water loss uh, reduction to reduce water requirement growth. Uh, yes, uh, municipalities and, and the water boards, not just around water and, and, and the department. Uh, is responsible for this. But as I said earlier, I believe everybody also has to pitch in uh, with an end in mind of um, uh, getting about 195 million cubic of water by, by 2026. Uh, also, we can track water use and update water requirements projections. Next slide. You can read the slides yourself. I just also want to emphasize the importance of maintaining and protecting existing system infrastructure. We have seen what happened in, 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 in KwaZulu-Natal. It's not only the weather or, or the climate. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the region was already vulnerable with, with uh, the distribution system in certain instances blocked. And, 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 and if you trace the blame, you may find that it's not just government, but, but it's, it's, it's ourselves the community as well. Um, we need really to, to, to manage ourselves and understand that this infrastructure is ours. I think there's a lot of awareness which is, which is, which is, which is necessary to deal with these issues. Uh, monitoring, 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 data and information monitoring is also very, very key. Uh, Chris, it's very, very Chris, important. Um, Next slide. Yes. If you can conclude, please. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm about to conclude. Maybe we can go to the last slide. Click. Yes, concluding remarks. Sorry for taking so long. South Africa is water scarce and has a highly variable climate. There's also water scarcity of access, especially among poor and vulnerable communities. Water is unevenly distributed countrywide. Identified strategic interventions such as water conservation demand management, water development projects, diversifying uh, the water mix and uh, development of, 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 of water projects and uh, quality management transfer of water from where it, there's a lot to where it's needed and uh, monitoring data and information is essential for planning management and modeling. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I would encourage um, delegates to put uh, questions in the chat and so that the speakers can respond um, immediately. Now I would uh, like to request Professor Bega to come to talk to us about the meteorological perspectives. Good morning. I'm trying to share. Um, I wonder if you can see something. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see. OK, good morning. It's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. Um, thank you for the WRC for the invitation. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the meteorological perspective on drought and climate, and it's by far the easiest of the topics on the agenda. I'm glad I don't have Barry's job. So the meteorology is complex, but we've studied it for more than uh, half a century. Uh, many of that funded by the WRC. So most of the future work lies at the interdisciplinary interface that includes people. And it's a sentiment that the WRC rightly shares if you look at the current funding focus. So the Eastern Cape has a very complex geography. It has steep topography. Uh, uh, soil vegetation gradients there's also the warm meandering agullus current the strongest western boundary current in all the oceans that occasionally bulges in sore and uh, they we, know, we call that the natal pulses and the temperature of the, the agullus also play an important role in modulating rainfall over the eastern cape when we add the socio-economic situation we end up with the eastern cape province as the most severe in terms of inequality with regards to water seen from this analysis by Cole and others. Um, it shows the Lorenz curve for provincial per capita water use. The more the curve deviates from, um, from the, the perfect uh, li equality line here in black, 
the larger the, the inequality, which is similar to the Gini coefficient that I'm sure you all know. Uh, we've looked at this uh, distribution of annual rainfall. Um, this analysis on the right from Matlalela and others focuses on the two catchment areas that feeds the Eastern Cape water resources. The middle graph, uh, the middle graph shows the so it's the levels of the dams, and here at the bottom we can see how the, ra the rainfall deviates from the mean level levels uh, uh, in time. You can also see the dry droughts during the 2016, 17, and 2019 periods. The most important synoptic pattern for rainfall over southern Africa is arguably uh, this tropical temperate troughs. These cloud bands form when extratropical uh, uh, westerly waves like these pass over the southern tip of the continent and they link with uh, tropical lows uh, to form this very characteristic cloud band all the way from the cold low in the south to the warm tropical low in the north. These systems produce most of the rainfall over the interior and it's associated with widespread rain over South Africa. Its position and seasonal movement uh, is one of the most dominant drivers of how rainfall varies from season to season. And Hart et al. Uh, have done a very nice analysis showing how they move away from the, the country over El Nino periods. You can see on the uh, synoptic charts the middle troposphere, this westerly wave. Sometimes these circulation cut off, and we call that a cutoff low. And this would lead to a more extreme version of the same system. The second most important system for the Eastern Cape rainfall is the reaching anticyclones. On a weekly basis, you'll see the Atlantic high pressure bulge around the tip of Africa as it uh, follows cold fronts that, that's moved uh, eastwards. Uh, Tando and Daran have, have, have been working with the WRC on showing how the position of this high has a major role to play in the amount of rainfall and when the highs are more to the north uh, it leads to more rainfall. So as with the tropical temperate trough we see that the position of these systems uh, governs rainfall and when we later discuss rainfall variability you must imagine how planetary circulation can call this the, the mean positions of these systems to slightly shift and have a big impact on annual rainfall over uh, this region. The, the third system is westerly waves, which we associate with a passing cold front. You can see the front there and the characteristic cloud band. Um, these bring a good bit of rain uh, to the eastern Cape. And uh, similar to the tropical temperate troughs, sometimes they form a closed circular, circular low, which we then call, uh, have a more extreme version um, Molequa in 2013 did an analysis specifically focusing on how these cutoff lows and westerly waves impact uh, rainfall in the Eastern Cape. Um, this paper by Christine Engelbrecht and others uh, attributes the contribution of these different synoptic systems to rainfall over the southern coast, and I think we can use that for the Eastern Cape. You can see how tropical temperate troughs, reaching highs, and then these westerly waves uh, contribute to rainfall and you can see also the important role that cutoff lows play and we, we can also say that cutoff lows are frequently associated with flooding as we saw in the last month over the KZN. An important thing to keep in mind is the distribution of rainfall. This is from the w DWS website and here I show a particular station. If we do a, a frequency histogram, you can see that rainfall is typically not normally distributed but positively skewed. So if we use the normal distribution, we will also almost overestimate the, the typical rainfall. And this is characteristic of this graph where you see a much larger blue area than uh, the orange. Uh, we use the same principle to define uh, the standard precipitation index. Uh, we, we take the average for a specific uh, time period, and then we can compare, uh, we can compare the, uh, the, the uh, rainfall to the distribution on a climatological perspective, and then identify whether that, that specific point is below or above uh, rainfall for a spe specific uh, time period. 
Um, I saw an uh, uh, analysis like this on the DWS site a while ago, but I couldn't find it. Maybe somebody can point us in that direction. Um, this is from the DWS website. You can see it nicely monitoring uh, the status of rainfall in the province. Interesting side note, it almost seems like this particular analysis don't use the gamma distribution like this one from the, the same website, but this would lead to a slightly exaggerated uh, dry meteorological perspective. If we look at time series of rainfall, we see that it cycles up and down um, these patterns have been correlated with warming and cooling in the Pacific Ocean, uh, the correlations up to about 40% of annual rainfall. The most uh, dominant of these interannual cycles that we, we call uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, but there's also other cycles. There's one between 8 and uh, 13 years which we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillations, and others between 15 and 20, uh, 28 years, the Interdecadal Specific Oscillation. These different drivers work together, and sometimes they, they uh, strengthen each other, and other times they weaken and almost uh, disappear. So the last two years, we've been seeing uh, experience uncharacteristic prolonged uh, La Nina, uh, the cooling event in a specific that we associate with above normal rainfall and almost doubling of those tropical temperate troughs uh, that I mentioned. And this is the predicted future um, and I'm sure uh, these pictures keep very up at night. Um, a detailed analysis by Kruger and Mamalu uh, shows how rainfall has changed over the last century. Unfortunately, it was done only to 2015, so it, it doesn't include the droughts since then. Um, it shows wetter conditions in the western parts of the Eastern Cape and drier uh, over the east. And there's also seems to be a shift in the seasonal patterns with a particular impact in the autumn and springs and a dry, drying of the spring. Uh, if we look at prolonged dry periods, there's also some uh, mixed messages with uh, a little bit more drying towards the west, which is the more important uh, rainfall area. Now, uh, if we compare this with climate predictions, it's a bit more confusing. This analysis by Malathlela shows the projections from 36 different climate models. The top one shows the historical uh, annual distribution from each of those module models. Uh, the middle shows the predictions for 2050, and the bottom one shows the difference, and you can see a, a, a slight increase in the winter and then a decrease in uh, spring. Uh, autumn and, and, and summer is projected from for climate. So to conclude, we have a good understanding of the meteorological drivers of rainfall variability over the Eastern Cape, and there's historical evidence that the variability of rainfall is increasing over time. So the message from the meteorological perspective is that the water will become more difficult to manage in the future. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, without a um, waste of time, I'll just um, request uh, Professor Jordan to come and talk to us about disaster preparedness. Thank you, Jay. Let me just upload. Am I still in the meeting? Yes, uh, we are waiting for the display of the presentation. Okay, is my presentation on? Can I continue? Please share, click on the share button at the top. Okay, I already tried to share it. Okay, let me try again. Should be there now. Yes, it's there now. Let's put put it on a slight right. slight mode. Yes. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. 
Uh, Jay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to just touch on one of the different elements that we can introduce to make us more drought resilient. I, I think Nelson Mandela Bay already did a lot uh, 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 the past few years. I was following what they were doing, but uh, I have a sense that in most cases we are dealing with drought from, from a, uh, a perspective of, of response. We, uh, a drought response is normally too little too late. And we know in South Africa that drought is not a new thing. There's already uh, a good documentation about drought. Uh, uh, of multi-year droughts in the 1700s, in the 1800s. And then also very interesting is that that part of our society was sort of formed because of drought. We, we think of the Mahratule Mfekani uh, periods of drought in, in the early 1800s, which was a catalyst actually for the establishment of the Great Zulu Nation. Uh, in the 20th century, we experienced a number of droughts. But if we look at drought response and the history of drought relief in South Africa, it was mainly focused on agriculture. And within agriculture is itself, we make the same mistakes all over and over. Already in, in the early 1920s, there, there was a report out where, uh, uh, where farmers agree and government agree that, for example, uh, providing of, of feed, feed and fodder during droughts is 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 a very in, inefficient uh, way to do drought response and to assist farmers. Yet we are still doing it today, 80 100, and 100 years later. So for the past 10, 20 years, we start focusing on urban droughts. We think of 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 the nearly uh, day zero in Cape Town. Uh, Nelson Mandela Bay is now close to a day zero. And we need to learn the lessons uh, from the past. So we need to acknowledge that we are in a water constrained economy. The pre previous speakers already mentioned that. And, and uh, I fully support, I think Chris mentioned it a number of times, that we cannot blame the current problems with drought on climate change. Uh, uh, because we have population growth, we have economic development, and we cannot develop and population cannot settle in places where we are water constrained. So we need to acknowledge that we need to be better prepared. So some of the things that we need to, to do is to have better drought risk assessments that include scenario planning, and cost benefit analysis. Uh, that will help, help us to be prepared better. It will assist with timely action. Obviously, timely action will depend on proper early warning and monitoring and then also implementation of contingency plans. So this is one of the aspects of resilience building that I want to talk about. We all know that we live in a climate profile where we have normal presentation or normal uh, uh, demand supply conditions for water, but on the one extreme we have floods and on the other extreme we have, we have drought. So during the normal times, we should do our preparedness planning, uh, make timely operational decisions and implement mitigation planning and be prepared for, for the extreme events. So what we recommend is that we need to have a proper drought classification system where we can monitor each of the, at least each of the quaternary catchments in the country, but then also for urban areas where we depend on, 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 on water, either surface water or groundwater, where we do the whole water catchment area, where we focus and classify the whole water catchment area according to a specific drought uh, classification. Uh, we know that we have the different types of drought, meteorological, hydrological, agricultural, and socioeconomical uh, drought, but we are facing also with artificial droughts and those artificial droughts or man-made droughts are taking place whether we have uh, during a drought or, 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 or during fl flooding times and, and that is uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, our uh, uh, water loss 
at municipalities is more than 40 percent. So that type of droughts is man-made and we can do something about it. When we look at drought cate categories and classification of, of droughts, already in 2017 under the leadership of the Department of Agriculture, we develop a, a drought indicator thresholds for different categories of drought from a D1, D0 to a D4 drought. Uh, it was submitted at that stage also to the uh, National Drought Coordinating Committee. It was accepted, but I'm not so sure it is really implemented. It would be nice today if we can go to a map of South Africa and see which of the which of the towns, which of the municipalities are in a D4? I suppose Nelson Mandela Bay is definitely in a D4 situation, but that's not the situation in the whole of the country. So if we can accept nationally wise such a drought classification system for agriculture, obviously for each of the quaternary catchments, and then for urban areas for the water catchment areas. We also uh, uh, propose a, a, a drought monitoring system where the National Disaster Management Center will play a key role, where all the drought data from the Department of Water Affairs, from agriculture, the ARC, the CSIR, and all that data are captured centrally. Drought is monitoring on a 24-7 basis and on a weekly basis, the drought situation in the whole country is updated. Uh, so, if we look at potential drought indicators, obviously drought indicators, we cannot use a single indicator and different indicators are suitable for, for different conditions. For example, in uh, urban areas, we can look at the water stress index, water demand supply ratios, dam levels, the Z-score for surface water supply, uh, Actually, the SPI, the way that we calculate the SPI can be applied for surface water supply, for stream, uh, stream flow as well as dam levels, meteorological indicators, and then percentage of water losses. So these are just a number of indicators that we, we can use. But we need to develop thresholds for the different indicators. Uh, it was mentioned by, by Rulof that, that rainfall is not uh, uh, normally distributed, it is a bit skewed, but this is just an example to show that we can use the Z-score or the same calculation as the SPI to have a category, different drought categories from a D0 to, to a D4, but we need to have to develop thresholds that standardized right through the country. And the reason for the different categories is that as we develop and as an urban area, a municipality or a certain catchment develop from a D0 to a D1, we need to implement certain drought contingency plans. What has happened currently is that we wait until we are at a D3 situation, then we are already close to crisis mode, already in a crisis mode, we wait for declaration of, of a national or provincial or a local uh, state of drought disaster and then we start implementing uh, our contingency plans. It is already too late. We need to start implementing our contingency plans at the D0 uh, drought and as a drought progress we need to improve and, and implement more, more measures. And then also after the drought we need to implement drought recovery plans because the drought doesn't stop when when we receive our first rates. So this is just one of the, I think the measures we need to put in place alongside many other measures that were, were mentioned by other speakers this morning to, to, to be better prepared for drought. Uh, I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, uh, Prof. Jordan. Um, apologies, I was uh, muted. Um, we'll now request um, Nontlanta to come and talk uh, to us about water, water use and desalination. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, let me just try to upload my presentation in the meantime. And then at the very same time, I am going to also try to switch my camera on. OK, um, yeah. Um, can I just uh, maybe go through the presentation and then towards the very end, Chair? Since I've already switched screens, I am going to try to switch my camera on just to show the face that is doing the presentation. Uh, I wouldn't want uh, to waste your time uh, for now. All right, the presentation that I am going to do is on implementing water reuse and desalination. And I'm just going to try to go through some of the key considerations from lessons as well as research that has occurred in South Africa. So just to make sure that we are on the same page with everyone. Uh, so each time I mention the term desalination, I'm referring to the treatment of either brackish or seawater. And for water reuse and reclamation, it refers to the recycling uh, for non-portable uses. And in other cases, the treatment of effluent uh, for both portable and non-portable uses. So both of these terms, you will see that uh, for consistency are the same terms that are used in the uh, national documents. All right, uh, so one of the studies that uh, was commissioned by the Water Research Commission is to look at uh, the experiences from South Africa so far in terms of the cost and operation of desalination and water reuse plants. So obviously you would know that as of today, there are a number of them. So around this uh, uh, document or this report was released around uh, 20, uh, 2016, 2015 there. So it, it contains information of the plants that were existing there. So the report did show that obviously most of the plants were not part of a long-term planning. They were planned as emergency plans, as a response to a drought situation, I think as the previous prof has uh, said. And obviously you can imagine most of the things, um, yeah, there are so many um, uh, things that you would overlook uh, when planning for an emergency plant. So the key lessons, um, or the considerations for future plans that really can be uh, maybe picked up based on um, the existing plans then, is that alternative supply options, they need to be part of a long-term water supply mix strategy. They shouldn't just be planned because there is a drought, but it should be part of, well, after you having looked at the demand and the projection, then population change and so on and so forth. And also there is a need to understand the regulatory environment and implementation aspects. So this uh, we have also seen play out in the international scene as well as in South Africa, that there is a, a it is very important uh, to do the due diligence so that you can be aware of the applicable legislations, the regulations, and the project delivery method as this has a bearing on the total cost of the project as well as the skill, skills capacity in terms of uh, the implementing agent um, is their skills to build, to operate the plant, and so on and so forth. And also to be aware of the stakeholders that need to be engaged, that need to be part of the process as you're implementing the plant, uh, whether it is your water users or it is just the public or um, uh, what we refer to as uh, consumers in short. And then also the importance of feasibility studies as well as technology demonstration. Because through feasibility studies, you will get to know what is the ideal plant location and the sizing, as well as the environmental requirements and the availability of an energy source, uh, especially in the case of desalination, as we know that it is a very high energy intensive uh, process. And then also historical water quality analysis is very important so that you can be able to design your process uh, that you're going to use and then also select the appropriate technology to give you the intended water quality, which might be drinking water quality in the um, case of a municipality. And then also making a full cost and benefit or doing a, a, a 
full cost and benefit study and having a business case uh, for the project that you want to implement. So obviously what we already know is that compared to the other options, whether we're talking um, water reuse, we're talking groundwater or your surface water, desalination is expensive. But obviously, like uh, Barry Martin has uh, said, just desalination has to be looked at the context of are we talking about a coastal municipality? Because, I mean, if it's a coastal municipality where really the cost of transferring water from one scheme to the next is impossible, then desalination becomes a viable option to address that localized uh, water scarcity. But obviously, subject to uh, the economics, if the economics make sense, and also the availability of uh, the water, uh, uh, the raw water, uh, in the case of uh, water reuse. I've already spoken about the importance of technology demonstration prior to full scale implementation, because that is a test run of your process to see if your process will give you uh, the intended water quality. And then what we've learned uh, quite recently is the importance of an advisory panel. Uh, which I am going to talk about in the next uh, uh, slide also. So most of the, 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 the documentation that is available at Water Research Commission, you will see that it touches on almost all the aspects of implementation or whether we're talking water reuse or whether we're talking about um, uh, desalination. There is documentation or reports that you will find on selection of the appropriate uh, technologies, uh, the costing of those technologies, uh, how to implement water reuse, uh, how to implement desalination projects, as well as how to implement water reuse project. So the very last one there, it is a guideline that uh, we have completed, completed recently. And the WRC together with IMESA will be conducting training workshops or to cover all the information or some of the key considerations on water reuse um, so far. So I want to come back uh, to this one as I think I understand that the technical aspects, most of us, I think we do understand there is a technology to treat any water by now to any quality that you would want. But what we have seen is the importance of doing the due diligence in terms of the environmental requirements and in terms of stakeholder engagement. So um, over the past uh, a few years, what we have also concentrated on, on the, at the Water Research Commission is to look at how can we support municipalities in terms of uh, giving them the necessary tools and guidelines on when, when is the right time to start engaging your stakeholders and what information really should you be um, taking out to your stakeholders. And also, before you even take out that information, this is very important to understand what is the baseline knowledge of you uh, stakeholders or the public in that case. So we have these tools. Uh, so what I show there, it is a document that will give you a, a generic uh, questionnaire which you can really use for stakeholders to determine the baseline information. And based on that, you then you'll be able to know uh, what information should I be taking out at what time? And then also what mode of communication or media uh, can I use to reach uh, the different stakeholders? And then based on that, then you should be able to also develop your own uh, communication strategy whether for your water reuse or your desalination project. So what I show that uh, news clip, it is quite recent. It is uh, something that happened at the US. Uh, we also know that the US, uh, specifically California, has been going through serious drought. But obviously, you, as you can see that uh, this project was stopped uh, by the environmentalists. That's why I'm saying that it is very important to understand the env environmentally regulatory requirements as well as uh, engage all stakeholders in the process. And then in terms of cost, obviously we have learned that um, uh, for water use and, and desalination, the cost is interrelated to the factors that uh, include your project delivery method. Uh, how do you share risk um, between uh, either the implementer, the contractors, 
or whether you want to purchase the water from an independent producer or you would want to subcontract uh, construction O and M and then um, uh, through a different project delivery method. And then I've spoken about plant size, plant location, your source water technology choice, as well as the availability of uh, energy or including in the process some form of energy efficiency or recovery devices as well as I also had um, uh, Barry Martin also sp speaking about brine management. It is very important. Right now we can see that most of the, 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 um, the world is moving towards resource recovery or implementing what we call zero waste plants to really avoid um, putting back uh, that concentrated brine, brine, in, brine into, into the ocean. And once again, obviously, the environmental regulatory regime is very important in terms of cost. And you, if you understand uh, some of the issues with the, the Australian plants, you can see that most of them, the cost was pushed up by the uh, different environmental requirements in terms of brine uh, discharge. I just put this slide here just to show what could happen uh, in under conditions of variable physical and business environment. So I've just picked up to show that uh, this is from a World Bank study that was done in 2019 to show that in other parts of the world, the cost of desalination is indeed coming down because of the maturity of that market today, obviously, I must put that out today, uh, because obviously that maturity of the market that comes with maturity of implementation in terms of capacity and skills to implement uh, such plans. And uh, so you can see if I convert these prices to the South African rand um, using a 15 uh, rand to $1 rate, you can see that there are o &M costs for that plant today along in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they range around 5 rand 23 and the cost of water production around uh, 9 rand 57. So it is very important that I think in South Africa also we start towards building the capacity and the skills that we need for implementing such projects. And for some ideas on how to build the capacity, uh, so I've spoke about an advisory panel is one of the things that we have learned. So we have seen the value of that. So the city of Cape Town is going that route and they are planning to appoint an independent expert panel and we are working with them. So the role of the panel is to provide that oversight to give that um, expert advice and opinion on each and every decision or stages of the project. And Umgeni Water as well uh, have taken that route. Uh, we are working with them uh, to implement a, an advisory expert panel, which is equivalent to your uh, steering group uh, in, in other parts of, of the world. So the other um, avenue for capacity building, we have been having this desalination community of practice running for a while now. It is very important. It is unfortunate that really most municipalities do not take advantage of this platform where really we can have that peer to peer learning so that we cannot so that we can avoid uh, people making the same mistakes that other uh, I would say municipalities have made. So I uh, would really encourage um, everyone to maybe be part of this. Uh, forum, I think there is much value in the knowledge or the content that is uh, presented today. Chair, that is the end of my presentation and to, to download any of the reports, uh, they are available on our Water Research Commission website, except for the water reuse guide that is still under production. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 I think we need to move to the rest of the presentations because of time and then if it time allows then we can come back to the questions for all the the, the presentations. Uh, I would therefore like to invite um, Shafiq to come and talk to us about the interventions. Hi, brilliant. Um, colleagues, um, 
this is me. I'm going to switch off and uh, try and get to presentation mode. Um, OK. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, um, we okay. can see. Thanks, thanks um, for, for that. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the, the, the supply options and, and, and getting towards a mix. Um, and, 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 and how do we um, get there and, uh, and, 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 and what should be the approach? And then I'm going to exemplify it using uh, groundwater um, because of time constraints. And it's also something that, that I'm much more comfortable than, than the other options. Um, so just to get off my chest. Um, I, I think um, there, there's, there's a couple of things, and one can call them buzz phrases. That, or that, um, and I think we need to get into a mode of, in periods of drought, we should also prepare for floods. Uh, we have those recent uh, um, examples, um, and we should not just see that the, the drought is going to continue, but are we also ready for floods in terms of, of disaster management uh, and in terms of, of, of capturing um, some of those excess um, uh, uh, water. Um, and so far also, I, I think and uh, one of my things, uh, bulk, the bulk only focus makes me sulk um, because water security and resilient is just not dependent on, on, on bulk supply schemes. I understand, of course, um, that, that, that a lot of our institutions are, are set up in, in, in this regard. Uh, but water security at the household or domestic level can come from a variety of sources. And this might be shown if there's no water in the dam. Um, and we should not plan like uh, we're going to receive rain very soon. Um, and again, just to, 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 to also talk about um, what we've heard this morning, climate change cannot be blamed for everything. Um, and, and, and of course, it, it, um, this is from, 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 from nature. Um, an article that says that less than 50% uh, of South Africans are, are climate uh, literate, if, if you like. And of course, it varies. It's just, it's just a, a percentage overall. But again, I think that is being misused uh, to blame everything. And then, of course, there, there are also man-made droughts. And so, so part of the focus of well, what we are saying is that we should uh, diversify our supply mix. Uh, we need to get to a point where we have a lot of resources, whether they are small, whether they are large, etc., and it, and then apply them at, at various scales because domestic, for example, is domestic water security can come from rainwater harvesting. It can come from um, 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 uh, localized uh, balls or well field schemes, uh, etc. And again, um, we have a, a variety of, of options at different scales. And of course, if it's not raining, you can't use some of some of them, but in some cases, if you have water, we've heard about recirculating that water and you're reusing it, um, developing new sources of water, um, etc. But of course, a part of the focus of today's discussion as well is how do we improve our predictions and, 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 and that of our, our hydrological responses? How do we better plan for this? So we always have a, a kind of a, a, a forecasting uh, mode and we plan accordingly, not when we're in the middle of the of, of, of the crisis, then 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 then, then we um, uh, throw everything at it. But of course, we've also heard that needs to be coupled with, with other issues, water sensitive design, water wise uh, use in the um, uh, efficiency uh, optimization, good land use planning, etc. And, and a combination of these get get to us uh, where we want. But of course, when you're in emergency mode, you just want to get more supply in, into the system, but you also need to as, understand how that more supply is being used on the, on the other side and, and also manage uh, those type of things. Uh, so, and again, in, in water supply uh, uh, sources, and then again, I just use, I, I use it from a city to a household that's not connected, because if you're thinking bulk, it means it goes into a bulk system and we assume that, that these systems are connected to all households. And of course, we know that is not, not the case and more so for, for the Eastern Cape. But so what is what are our options? What are people already using? Uh, and should our focus only be this bulk surface water and bulk groundwater and bulk diesel, et cetera? Because clearly from, 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 from this sketch, it does not reach everyone. So how do we get uh, people water secure, et cetera? And, um, and, and, and of course, 
if you if you Google any or if you go to search.wrc.org.za and you put any of those in, in there, you will get some uh, um, uh, work work on that. Um, and again, so I'm going to now focus on on on, uh, on, on groundwater and and then and, and see how how can how we have we developed it, use examples, and what are the issues and what do we need to fix. Um, so we know, for example, in 2008 and even before that, the geological work started around uh, the Nelson Mandela Bay municipality identifying these uh, groundwater domains. Uh, which I believe was then used to zoom into the current developments, etc. So again, you see from 2008 and 10 years later, we start to really, uh, we, when we in, in the middle of a crisis, we start to, 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 um, to really put effort to that. And of course, with that comes all, all the challenges. But I must say, um, Nelson Mandela Bay is one of the very good examples and excellent examples of how it should be done. And we'll talk about it now. Uh, and, and so again, one can look at uh, peculiarities of, of groundwater. It's a very localized resource. So these national or province maps do not help anyone. You need to go to uh, where, where you need to target your, your, your balls, to build your well field, to actually supply water. Uh, in South Africa, so we know our hydrogeology is extremely complex. Uh, it's not easy. It's faulted, it's folded, it's mineralized, and all of these things. So. The approach to a sandy system is, is totally different. Uh, and we've done some work in, in this. And so this is basically what you need to do. And, and Nelson Mandela Bay work has gone through most of these things over, uh, over, over, over a period um, to identify the targets and drill and drilling. But what we've seen in crisis, uh, when we do these um, uh, emergency drilling, we start from drilling uh, and then we hope we we, we get water. So we're basically wildcatting what they use in, in 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 the oil industry. So we kind of this is how we. But we have so we need to be sophisticated to develop to to develop the best target. And and most procurement things that that you can look at in most municipalities start with we want to drill balls, not we want to do the geological and geophysical and whatever work to get us to suitable potential targets. So they go straight to procuring drilling services and drilling for balls and drilling holes and whatever goes with it. So the procurement needs to change to the scientific approach. And 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 the and 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 the, and the result if you do this um, is what we've seen for example with the with the Kuha Kop. So I know um, it was proper exploration driven by the scientific method. Professionals were procured for all stages versus these contractors. And you hear the horror stories of the building contractor winning uh, a water development prog program, etc. Um, and of course, as you go along and, and what we've known, for example, we're going to have uh, water quality issues, but water quality issues we need to treat and we need to build treatment plants and this notion of the groundwater just needs to be fed into a tank and distributed must stop. We need to say, OK, we're going to treat because we give it to public. And if there are water quality uh, concerns and like Nelson Mandela Bay has done, is I believe um, the, the, the treatment uh, plant is in progress to knock out all the iron and manganese and whatever uh, that will be associated with, 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 with the plan. And, and, and this, this, this is the uh, result of, of doing something uh, well. Um, so, so I think we we need need to get in. So yeah, um, but but then there is the the the, the issues of when we have this uh, regional scheme. So if you bring it from a, from a from a bulk uh, from the dam or harib, you need to have a pipeline, and that pipeline goes into dams and treatment and storage and this gets through. But if you have now standalone or uh, a very localized state, a logistical challenge. You can just think, so you have got many of these small things scattered around uh, the place that needs to be managed. Um, and again, part of that problem is, is how, how we like to budget in, 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 the, in the public space or, or for these type of things. We're comfortable to raise the capex to say, you know, we're going to build this or we're going to fund that. And then the, because some of our bulk schemes like things, the OPEX kind of drops off, but it, it's there. Whereas a, 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 a groundwater scheme, for example, the capex might be way lower than, than a dam, for example. But over time, because it's so all over the place, 
it's so distributed, it needs to be connected, you need more people and more parkies to service these things, the OPEX goes up. And, and this is what we struggle with to, 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 to budget for because, so this is just conceptual, but it can go up and down. So two bolts or two uh, pumps break down. We don't have space. We know need to go through a procurement process. There's no budget, et, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the things that we need to um, get comfortable with. And similarly, with this type of long, for example, we see some of these uh, things that, that we say we want to build. And, and I think Non spoke to that. So this was a, um, I think non is one of your the life cycle analysis type of thing, but we also see that the environmental stuff also has that long tail. So it's not just about money. You need to think about other things at, at, at the same time. Uh, so and again, um, in, 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 the, in the groundwater world, there are two issues um, related to institutional capacity, related to technical uh, challenges and how do we approach this and how we do that and then and we need to get that right for all municipality and I think Nelson Mandela Bay is on to something. Um, it's just how, how are we going to uh, handle that long-term imp implementation and OPEX and, and maintaining these things because uh, South Africa is littered with uh, drought intervention ball and well field schemes um, that when the dams fill up, it's forgotten, the next drought comes, they new drilling all over the place, and they do not treat it as an asset, and they often do not know where it is. Um, and again, um, and, and a lot of these things, and again, I'm of the view that most of our problems is not a groundwater problem or a resource problem, but it's actually what's happening in a particular building with specific skills, how the institution budgets, uh, and run its OPEX, how it, how it provides its skills. Um, and again, so, so, so we look at, for example, at the, the Eastern Cape, and apologies for, for, for this uh, national map, but it gives you a picture that we started to think about, for example, what if it starts to rain now for a short period? Um, are we just going to watch the water evaporate, uh, watch some of the dam lift a bit, some of it flows into the sea? But are we ready, for example, to say if this water comes, do we have schemes where we can actually bank this water in our aquifers, switched off from um, from from evaporation? Uh, not that, that it's not uh, in catchment areas that it might see the dam, but we can actually um, go and bank it or, or put it in, in the subsurface. We've got a lot of work in this regard. Uh, Cape Flats, we we did a study some time ago and said, okay, but if can we move water around? Can we? Um, recharge the aquifer, and, and of course, quickly we can see you can almost double your 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 your, your water in storage and or availability by 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 doing the, the, these interventions. Um, and now, of course, all of these things need to be need to be context driven. Uh, this is a, a case, and some of you, it's a coastal town that they had the op 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 option of having a groundwater or diesel uh, plant. Um, they had these arguments: is the groundwater. Uh, maybe the risk is not that bad, but the cost and the, this thing of insurance, there's diesel, they, we have a sea, there will be water forever. Uh, and it was and, and and it was not even, I don't know how many months, the diesel system failed, and they did not go for a system that was six times cheaper. So in a particular context, we often make the wrong decision. We make engineering decisions because maybe it again, the the, the the, the discussion was, oh, but CAPEX, we can raise that, but this groundwater needs a bit more uh, complicated uh, interaction, etc. And so, so we don't know. So, and again, wh what was being said previously, uh, we have all the tools, the guides, we've got everything um, that we can, we have very poor capacity at the operational level, and this is just municipalities, we ask them if you have, and this was across two provinces, excluding Eastern Cape, uh, do you use groundwater? 79% says, said yes. Uh, do you have uh, specialized groundwater? 79% said no. I would contend and that that is actually 100% because they might have capacity, but it's not specialized groundwater personnel. And this is where the, 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 the problem, and Chris mentioned, for example, so we have very good operating rules for dams, uh, but not so for, for, for groundwater. And, and this is part of... Um, this good investment and good things that we're doing, for example, in Nelson Mandela Bay, will it have all these things that, that will, that will uh, uh, shock proof um, all these investments into the future? Uh, I don't know why is it going. There, there's inter in, in, intra institutional issues. Uh, we know this is a huge issues, uh, issue at the, at the local level. We cannot get it right. 
uh, some part department sits in stormwater, some sits in roads, some sits somewhere else, etc. And they do not necessarily talk to each other. Uh, and again, this then fuel this thing of the myths. Uh, the Eastern Cape, I've heard so many times that do we have a shortage of groundwater, we have a shortage of technical documents and guys, we have a shortage of funds, we have a shortage of hydrogeology, shortage, shortage, shortage. Um, but if we infinite now uh, 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 volume of, of groundwater some of these issues will come back because the problem is not in the resource the problem is in the in the institution and how we view it and how we manage it and, and we need to get uh, part of the of, of, of this right um, and and we just we there's a study uh, that, 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 that that's ongoing and this is the I think is the first deliverable and this is a um, uh, from from Nelson Mandela Bay area, and it's a study um, that the WRC is funding, and this is the first, and it's a very draft. But again, you can see what, and this is a perception uh, thing that they did in in workshop, um, and and you can see what what is helping us move forward towards sustainable ground. So it's very positive. But if you start looking at what is holding us back, and then you start seeing what is happening in buildings and with people and the cooperation, and then these are the things. That, 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 that we need to get right because ultimately we, we need to make better decisions uh, and that decisions should reflect what we want to do, not what we want to do now, but also what we want to do in the future um, and then constantly revisit. So, for example, we constantly hear about this adaptive approach, this um, and then we need to be context driven. We need to get that capacity, but capacity is not enough. You need to have the proper skills to, to do these things. So you can have at, 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 at the wastewater plant the right capacity. You've got all your organogram is full, but you, is, are those people skilled at, at, at operating those things, uh, which is not the same thing. Um, and often we say we don't have capacity or skills, uh, but I Back to Defra, I always say, give me your problem and in five minutes I'll give you five names. So then if, if you have that situation, you certainly do not have a... Um, and again, we need to look at the appropriate scales, at, at what level do we want to do, uh, how are we going to do it, etc. Because the water security problem now is, if, they, if this, um, uh, I don't know, 20 days is realized, all these bulk plans, is it going to help us? Or should we say, okay, but be more water-wise, conserve, be, change your behavior. Um, what are the local sources that we can reuse, reuse, uh, whatever? Um, and are there those technologies that's not in this bulk, big capex, uh, millions, billions, numbers, but but things that, 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 that we can say. And then we have had very good examples of those, for example, in, 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 in Limpopo. And again, we need to get on top of this real time what is happening, and then and glad to see, for example, we're using uh, sensors, et, et cetera. So again, getting in that conjunctive use, we're not saying use one over the other, but use it as 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 as, 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 as together and, 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 and so forth. Um, so brilliant, um, that's my story. I know I went fast, but um, I'm trying to help with catching up time, but also trying to convey the whole story. Thanks, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Shafiq, uh, I'll now request um, Baba Twinde to come and talk to us about the nature of these drugs. Uh, unmute uh, Baba Twinde. Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Baba Twinde. I would like to have my camera now and share my, my presentation. Um, oops. Sorry. Ah, uh, please, can you see my slide? Yes, uh, yes uh, put it on a slideshow mode. It's gone off. Can you see it? It's gone off. Put it on, uh, on again. Oh, it's off. Uh, share screen. 
iBat now? It's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk on the regionally extensive drought and possible land use based mitigation strategies within the context of a, a climate change. Um, in case I run out of time, I would rather like to start with the, my, the main point that I want to add to uh, what the previous uh, speakers have uh, said. Um, and these are the three main points. And the first one is that we should use more uh, more than uh, one drought index to monitor drought. So that's the key, first key message. Then the second key message I would like to uh, point out is we should pay attention to regionally extensive drought because most of the time when we talk about drought, we, we look at the local scale drought. But regionally extensive drought, uh, these are the kind of drought that cut across provinces, cut across countries. And knowing how they behave could help us in planning, in uh, trying to prepare for, uh, for how to mitigate uh, drought. And the third point is that we should invest more on nature-based solutions for mitigating drought. So I'll quickly go through those, uh, elaborate more on those three points. As we know, there are different types of drought indices, uh, ranging from meteorological drought to agricultural drought to um, hydrological drought. And, uh, but in most cases, uh, people, we, we use a um, um, meteorological drought because the data, the climate data are easily accessible. To, to monitor, I mean, to analyze the drought and monitor drought characteristics. And among this uh, drought, uh, meteorological drought, the most used one is uh, SPI. And SPI is based on precipitation. Um, but the main shortcoming of this drought index, uh, index is that it assumes that drought is only controlled by precipitation. While that is true to an extent, evaporation also contributes to drought because it determines the amount of water that is available. Okay, and when we use these two drought indices, so because of that, there is this idea of introducing a drought in this index that accounts for evaporation or potential evapotranspiration. And that leads to uh, this uh, the drought index called SPEI, which is Standardized Precipitation Index. And when we apply these two drought indices to look at uh, impact of climate change on drought frequency in the future, they have different results, as we can see. Uh, this is for SPEI, SPI, and we see the wide range in the and the result. Now, none of them is bad or none of them is uh, perfect. But this is um, what meteorological drought are saying. And when we bring it into the context of hydrological drought, the hydrological drought will line a uh, projection will line in between these two uh, uh, projections because SPI assume that no precipitation is occurring. Why SPEI assumes that all the amount of water that the atmosphere is requesting for potential evapotranspiration, it will actually get from the basin, which we know that is not also uh, true. So by using these two drought indices, it, uh, it, that will give us idea of where either the agricultural drought or hydrological drought could lie. Okay, and then the other idea, the other uh, good thing about using this is that it gives us, I mean, the difference between them is just because of evaporation or evapotranspiration. So it, it, it helps us to know if, uh, how to plan in mitigating the impact of a uh, climate ch uh, change on the, the drought. For example, if over a basin, if we can, uh, reduce the amount of 
uh, evapotranspiration that occurred over that basin, then the projection, hydrological projection, will tend towards the SPI. But if the atmosphere has access to all the moisture, the water it, goes, it requires from the basin, then the projection goes towards that of SP. Um, as, uh, um, the severity of future drought. That's the main something there. However, if we must choose one, I would strongly encourage that we use SPEI because it's better to overestimate the severity of the drought than to underestimate it. Then the next point, which is uh, understanding the characteristic of regionally extensive drought, uh, I will just illustrate that with this. Um, there's uh, one of the studies we did a few years ago and that we have also updated now. In this picture, in this uh, figure, we see uh, different patterns of drought. Three months drought ranges from 1950 to 2020. That's the SPI. Uh, the, the positive values means wet condition, while the negative values mean drought, uh, dry condition, drought. And these are different patterns. And we look at the extreme patterns. The extreme patterns are the, are the edges. So like in this case, Node 1 says that there is a pattern in which the entire Southern Africa uh, experienced uh, experience a wet condition. The extreme of that is when the entire region actually experiences dry condition. Then we have the dipole patterns in which the, not, uh, the tropical region experienced dry, while the opposite is the case over South, uh, South Africa. And then that's the other extreme. Now, how are these patterns behaved in the past few years? This shows the transition for different patterns. And here we have the years, and these are the different seasons. So the number indicate the drought, the pattern here. For example, uh, in DJF 1950, we have drought uh, node number six, which is this one, and followed by um, node one and so on. The color indicate the average SPI value uh, over the, the, the subregion, I mean, the over Southern Africa. So the, the, the brown one means negative values when we average it, why the blue one means the positive uh, values. Now, what comes out clearly immediately from this pattern is that we can see it's like there is a shift from wet conditions to dry. In other words, it seems the dry patterns are more dom are becoming more dominant, especially since 1982 or so. So the dry patterns are becoming more frequent. That's one. Then two, when we look at from 1920, uh, around 2015 upward, we see most of the drought patterns that dominate this region, uh, this uh, period has been node nine, 10, and six. What are they? Node nine, node 10 and node 11. And when we see all these patterns, they are inducing dry condition over the entire uh, South Africa. So that is how, the, and that explains, so that explains the, 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 the drought condition that we have been experiencing both over, look at this one, Western Cape 6, around there, over Western Cape and also uh, at the, 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 the Eastern Cape. So we need to pay attention to uh, regionally extensive drought. And if we are just to summarize the behavior, the decadal frequency of this regionally extensive drought, here is the wet one, the wet pattern. It's actually, the frequency is actually going. I mean, in the last three decades, we've only had about three occurrences of this wet pattern. But the dry patterns are becoming more and more frequent. And these are the ones that actually center over South Africa. So that gives us like a picture, a, 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 a globe, I mean, a larger picture of what the drought is uh, doing uh, over the region. How about the future? 
Here is the future projection of drought, frequency, and intensity. Uh, this is the, the, the frequency, uh, the intensity, and this is the frequency of a uh, severe drought over southern, over uh, the, the, the region, as depicted by SPEI and S, uh, SPEI and SPI. And these are the different warming levels. This has 1.5 degree, 2.0 degree, up to 3.0 degree. And what is the message here? The intensity of the drought over the region is increasing with the warming level. Then we see that the, the southwest region are projected, uh, the, the, the intensity and the frequency are projected to be uh, more, or the intensity more over this region. So, which means we need to start paying attention to this part of, uh, of, of the region. Then another message here is that SPE, SPI shows the same thing, but we can see that the intensity is quite weaker than what SPEI is saying. So, if we plan only with SPI, we might underestimate the severity and frequency of uh, uh, a drought, fissure drought. So we need to in either incorporate both drought indices. Now the message number three is nature-based solution, that we need to use nature-based solution uh, for reducing drought risk. And a lot of nature-based solution has been uh, suggested uh, in literature, and most of them are based on land use changes, things like land conservation, wetland restoration, vegetation swell, water harvesting um, system, permeable pavements, which will help to recharge the underground water and uh, agroforestry, uh, removal of uh, alien tree and even conservation of uh, conservation farming. So all these, we should put that in place. We should incorporate them. We should invest more in how we uh, in them and then use them to reduce the impact of a uh, drought over the region however before we invest heavily on any of this method there is need to investigate how efficient that method could be in mitigating drought and that requires some studies some uh, simulations with hydrological models uh, crop models and so on. I will demonstrate that with an example of uh, <clears throat> the study we carried out over the the, the vast uh, river basin. And this basin, we try to look at to what extent can we use grassland resolution uh, uh, restoration to mitigate impact of drought and um, climate change on drought over the basin. So here is the present land use, as we can see, mostly grasses. Then we have uh, crop activities here. Here we have mixture of crop activities and uh, uh, and the grasses. So the idea is that if we restore grassland, so moving from here to here, how can that <clears throat> affect or mitigate impact of a uh, hydrological drought? Here is just the the, the result. This is the uh, soil water percolation runoff and stream flow simulated. Uh, this is the situation for the present day climate. As you can see, there is high, uh, uh, white water, uh, high values of soil water over the eastern part and so on, then the percolation. Now with climate, with impact of climate change, <clears throat> we see that a decrease in soil moisture is projected over the region, a decrease in percolation, and decrease in runoff, of course, and this decrease in stream flow due to impact of climate change because there's a reduction, uh, a decrease in the uh, uh, precipitation and increase in potential evapotranspiration. Now, with uh, grassland restoration, <clears throat> we could see that uh, the, 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 the grass, the restoration actually helps improve the soil moisture with reference to uh, global warming at 3.0. We see an increase in soil moisture, and then there is tendency to have an increase in percolation, which means it will help in recharging uh, the, the, the groundwater. But then, then we see a decrease in runoff. 
which actually suggests that most of the water is actually stored in the soil rather than being uh, than running off this, the, the basin. And that, of course, leads a decrease in the stream flow of, of that valley. So, however, if we compare the amount of increase that we have here compared to the decrease here is quite high. So, but that will help us to see, okay, this is the an extent to which we can use this particular land cover change to mitigate uh, impact of uh, climate change. So this is just the conclusion, which is the same slide with what I showed earlier. We need to use more than one drought index in monitoring drought. Then we need to pay attention to what regional extensive drought is doing so that we can have a bigger picture of what is going on over our area and we need to invest more on nature-based solution for mitigating impact of drought risk. And finally, I want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. very much, uh, Baba Trinde. Interesting to start with the conclusion. Uh, now, um, uh, Mike Muller is traveling. Um, uh, we have um, requested one delay to make um, comments in this um, regard. There's also attached to the invitation, there's also uh, details of um, drought lessons uh, from the city of Cape Town uh, prepared by Gina Zerufoka. So I, I now hand over to uh, Wandile, uh, my colleague, to give us the presentation. Uh, good, good afternoon, brilliant, and everybody. Um, I think, Sengi, you might have to load that, but let me quickly give it a try. And if I fail, you'll have to load that presentation from Mike. And as brilliant said, I am not uh, Mike. Can you see the? Yes, we can. OK, sorry. I, well, I am, I am going to quickly run through the slides he sent us. And I'm so sorry that I'll have to do this quickly because uh, it is based, it, this is his presentation. And he, was, he kindly sent us this presentation to share uh, with, the, uh, with the participants here. And this is the presentation that he made at the Nelson Mandela University on the invitation, when he was invited to make, uh, to present a lecture at the South African Academy of Engineering in 2018. And his presentation is titled Decolonizing Engineering. But he has some examples here uh, of the situation that happened in Cape Town and some lessons that the, the Nelson Mandela Bay uh, Metro, Metro uh, can learn and some, some comments that he has made about that. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to run through quickly these slides. And the, yes, uh, on this particular slide, he tried to define uh, the roles of the engineers and how they are defined, uh, the, the, the true, true, uh, two roles. And then, and on the Cape Town issue, uh, as, as an example on how engineers or water resources planners, uh, what role they can play in water resources planning. The Bear River Dam, which was planned a long time ago, uh, on the basis that water demands or water requirements uh, in, in, in Cape Town can be met through improved demand management. And they were fearful also that if you are building a dam, it is going to raise the, to increase the costs of the Cape Town's water supply. And they were also concerned about the whole issues of environmental impacts and, and so on from the from the uh, the building of that dam from the Berg River Dam uh, system. So, and now, Cape Town has, I think, on a few occasions uh, in their planning documents, they made quite a few statements about how this is the the city of Cape Town, the administration from the city of Cape Town, making some statements about how the water conservation and the water demand management has been the best uh, in the country. And then in 2017, this is before the drought, by the way. And in, in 2017, 
and they said, well, there will be no need to ring fence billions of rand uh, for, for a drought that might not even come, which was pretty interesting, according to Mike. And what they missed uh, is the point about the population growth, which I think has been referred to here. And he argues that here that, you know, Cape Town Water Resources Planning, especially the thinking the administration of the Cape Metro, uh, is largely Eurocentric, that's how he put it, is largely Eurocentric. And those statements that have ma they have made, they have a, a whiff of arrogance about how water co conservation and demand management and, and so on uh, has been the best and there, there is no need to build a dam. And suddenly, if you look at the population growth in the continent, uh, the blue line uh, suggests that it is going to be very steep compared to what is happening in Europe. And if they are using those European concepts about <laughs> infrastructure, building the infrastructure in the country, then they are wrong. That's what he was arguing about. Then there was this issue of the Department of Water and Sanit Water Affairs or Water Affairs in those days uh, um, uh, being uh, given a qualified audit uh, specifically um, that they have incurred the highest irregular as well as fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Um, this was the Auditor General. This was in the news. And then the uh, the issues about the minister who has run the Department of Water uh, and some Department of Water Affairs to yeah he collapsed she well she's accused of collapsed that department. This is Scopa report. And then the infrastructure report card from the CAC, the South African Institute of Civil Engineering, uh, where they have pointed out as far back as 2017 that actually. Um, when categorizing the infrastructure in, in, in the country, all the bulk water infrastructure is on the verge of failure. Those D categories suggest that it is on the verge of failure. Um, this has been, this should have been a very, um, this should have been an important issue that should have been taken into account by the, the, the decision makers. And PE, and the Nelson Mandela Bay specifically declared uh, was declared as a disaster area. I think this must have been around <laughs> a year or so later, I'm not too sure. And he goes on to talk about what a developmental state is. And the reconciliation studies, they have been referred to by both um, Barry, Barry Martin and Chris Msegi. I'm not going to dwell on this one, but the point that is being emphasized here is Way, way back, as far back as 2011, there were projections that we need to build the infrastructure, um, uh, the water infrastructure needs to be um, uh, checked up in the Nelson Mandela Metro uh, because the demand for water was going to grow and it was growing. And on top of that, um, it needs uh, some sort of an insulator of sort uh, against what might be a, a drought. Um, and then yeah, and you know there were recommendations uh, in these um, uh, uh, reconciliation studies on what needs to be done exactly, and that was was that done. Uh, this is around 2010, and suddenly when that recommendation was made, I think this, it was the to build the Neutredacht uh, works, and and then it was delayed and so on. Then there was a mystery PE man who swindled. Uh, more than a billion rand uh, from the from the municipality, which was pretty strange. And uh, the company apparently its registration was quite um, questionable. And in the Nelson Mandela Metro's water master plan, there were some issues being highlighted there regarding the money. Uh, this is 2013 now. And the monies that were required to do that, um, to, to implement uh, the not for uh, scheme, the money that was required there, this is 2013, meaning uh, three or four years after that swindler had uh, gone or disappeared with a billion rand. The project had not been implemented. And then the leakages are also a big issues and the, also the skills that are not there. And one interesting, fact about what has been happening in the in Nelson Mandela Metro is uh, is codified, if you like, 
uh, in the book by Christian Olva. He was also a director general of the Department of, of Environmental Affairs. And in this particular book, he is trying to yeah, highlight how the metro, how the Nelson Mandela metro uh, was, uh, was captured and um, then bled dry by a syndicate, which he referred to as a syndicate from the ruling party. And then Mike Muller goes on to reflect on what the roles of the politicians should be. Politicians do not have technical skills in the first place. They are, they are you know, work time frames, time, time scales are a week, a month, or at most five years. Their job is to mobilize political support, and they should not be meddling in the operational, but well, they have been found to be meddling in the administration and, 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 and performance of the staff, which is pretty strange. And as a result of that, you will find that they are building these liabilities rather than building the assets uh, for, for the municipality. And he was trying to construct, to, to contrast the role of, of the politicians uh, against the roles of the, of, the, of the water resources planners. And for the engineers or the water resources planners, they, they have these long time horizons a decade planning and and so on, as you might have seen in the presentation by Chris Mseki and Barry Martin and others, they have that. But I just want to highlight the the bullet at the bottom there, that, you know, the issues, the water crisis um, that you are experiencing currently uh, in, in, in the Nelson Mandela Metro is not much of a technical issue. It is a a people problem. That's how he put it. And um, they have been by the water resources planning, you know, this long term horizon saying that we need to build the infrastructure and suddenly those ones are being um, frustrated by the politicians who meddle in this. And if you are to implement any of the suggested infrastructure, it should be benefiting the political, the local political elite as it was the case uh, in the Nelson Mandela Metro. So in conclusion, he is concluding by saying that the crisis, specifically in, 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 in Cape Town, uh, they need uh, a, a demonstrate that there should be a local focus on the expertise there. The, this equally applies to the Nelson Mandela Metro uh, and so on. And he is calling upon uh, the water resources planners to assert their role so that they can challenge the politicians on their governance failures uh, uh, and so on. Now, he, he also made a call. Yeah, well, this is the conclusion. This is his conclusion. He's making a call uh, uh, to all the municipalities and so on, uh, specifically Nelson Mandela and so on, to please make sure that the water resources planners are technical, uh, uh, are technical competent people that are, are, are appointed there. You know, this political meddling uh, by the, the or political interference by the politicians, they should be reminded that their role is not uh, the administration of the municipality. Their role is to do the oversight and not to be seen to be influencing the appointment of anyone uh, in the municipality. I think that is that, uh, Chair. Uh, that's Mike Muller's presentation. Sorry, I hope I have not misrepresented whatever message he was trying to put across. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Wandile. One or two burning questions, if you have. Otherwise, we are just about to conclude. Okay. This has been a very empowering um, um, engagement befitting uh, a developmental state. It, uh, it is just basically saying that um, the power is in our hands to increase uh, the resilience. 
we know what is wrong and we know um, uh, how we can fix, uh, fix it. Let us just have a good uh, support environment so that then we increase the, increase the resilience to deal with um, climate change, the extreme um, weather events. So it, it's very, very helpful, very empowering to different, to a variety of uh, stakeholders so that then we deal with these uh, issues up front and we uh, are not going to wait for a disaster to happen uh, anymore. Uh, this partnership will um, take it forward to uh, um, uh, increase our resilience and build our sustainability. And um, with that, I'll uh, now hand over to Shafiq and Goliza to do um, a closure and uh, way forward. Thank you very much. Uh, just a moment, Shafiq, there's one hand. Uh, Pilinda, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Shafiq. Pilinda? Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. I just have a concerning question, uh, seeing that we're hitting our day zero in a moment. Um, and with everything in place, um, as an individual, as an owner, um, I'm very happy uh, with our municipality trying to do their best. But uh, my question of concern is, what are we going to do with the people that does not pay their rights and tax that are still wasting water? Uh, taps are running, um, especially um, our brothers and sisters in the northern areas. And not only there, but also other places that don't pay water, that's abusing the water. And that comes at the end of the day, it comes from us and they run bowls of millions and millions of rains. But um, I know that we do issue fines at times. If we do find them doing that, um, yeah, that was just a question, a concern of mine is how are we going to deal with that situation? Um, Barry? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. The bottom line is, if you use too much water, you will pay for that water. Water is being metered, and if you uh, and water is charged in terms of a step tariff, so you use more, you, uh, and you waste that water, you go into higher step of tariff, and then the proverbial punitive water tariffs come come into effect. The municipality is rolling out a program of metering all outstanding areas of metering and this is just the areas of uh, recently low cost constructed low cost housing and the bottom line is if you use too much water and um, as it is currently even if you are able to pay for that water the municipal manager the municipal municipality will in, uh, install a water management water meter that will restrict your water consumption to a limited amount per day thank you Thank you very much. Uh, Barry, over to you, Shafiq. Uh, thank, thanks, Brilliant. And, uh, th th and thanks to, to all the participants. Um, um, I, I think that, that this is a very healthy way of, 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 of doing this by, um, by sharing the knowledge, um, empowering uh, people. Um, I, I get a sense that we have a, a cross section of society and not just a uh, discussion um, amongst the uh, academics. Um, as I said earlier, we South Africa has a very low climate change uh, literacy, um, and then and then part of these uh, events is also to 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 up that um, to, to to get better understanding of how it impacts us, how how we need to adapt, um, and then and, and rightfully, and it, I think it was emphasised um, a, a lot today is that. It is not just a government responsibility. It's not just a municipality responsibility. It's a responsibility uh, of all of us. All of us need to bring our part. Um, my understanding also, for example, in, 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 in Nelson Mandela Bay, and, and just to use that example, is that the water use is still unacceptable. And, and the question is, um, where does um, society want to drive this? Um, and, and then we need to get into the mode and say, okay, uh, we realize what, what the issue is, 
We need to drive down our consumption um, while we uh, get to um, the, 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 the um, implementation of, of alternatives. Um, and of course, we, we hope that it, that it will start receiving uh, rainfall to, 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 um, to mitigate against uh, this drought. But at the same time as well is that um, full dams also do not uh, provide uh, water security all the time. And we see it all, the, all, all over the place as well. You might have dams, but if there's no services, if there's no infrastructure, if the quality is poor, you still have, do not have access to, to, to adequate water security. So, uh, and I think that that's how we should start framing it. And, and of course, it, as, as I've also indicated, at various scales and in, 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 in what, um, in what context um, do we need to deal with it and how do we deal with it and, and what are the best uh, solutions with, with it. And, and, and it's unfortunate as well that, um, that, that the, the, the research and innovation uptake is, is, is not where it should be. And, and then often we get accused sitting in acad academia or the research side uh, when it appears that, that we are preachy and we we having this uh, I told you so uh, um, um, approach to, to, to when there's disasters, where there is the, 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 the fast uh, ones like the floods that we saw or the, or the droughts. But we need to get on top of it. And the way we get on top of this is, to, is by proper planning and management. Um, and all of these things, hopefully, then that just becomes a, a, a bump in the road um, in terms of how we manage it. But it does not, all these bumps should not be, uh, uh, appear to be a crisis after a crisis after a crisis. It's just that if we say, for example, there will be water restrictions that everyone um, in society responds to that uh, and realize. But of course, people that's also tasked with providing these services uh, bring will bring their part in, 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 in whatever happens in, in the, those buildings need, needs to be fixed. So, uh, all uh, often when we say change water use behaviors, it's not just meant for 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 for, for the users, citizens, but also for people that it's implementing these these schemes. Um, not to just focus on, on on one solution. And I always use the analogy, for example, that um, we when you look at your 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 your, your whether it's your retirement uh, portfolio, etc., and if your Portfolio manager only uh, invest all your money in, in one high risk um, uh, portfolio. Um, you'll fire him because uh, you are exposed. And the way we deal with this, we spread our risk um, across many many many, many portfolios. Um, and then and then when there's a, a crisis in one, the the other uh, other ones help you out over over that that time and does not. Um, allow your 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 whole pension to to crash, and and that should be the same uh, for 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 water security as well. Um, so there, there's a lot to be done um, uh, in terms of research and innovation uptake. There's a lot to be done in how citizens um, use it. There's a lot of to be done by 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 media as well, and and not just always be alarmist, um, but also help create this awareness, uh, create this this this. Um, um, uh, in people that say we need to save water, write the article on how we can we save water and what should we be doing, not just who's at fault, etc. When we in uh, situations that do affect all of us um, um, at this stage. So hopefully this partnership um, between um, the various um, academic and research institutions, uh, the national department and the local authorities lead to this, this change in how do we do things and how do we um, provide this water security and resilience going going forward? Uh, but uh, well, we all need to 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 to, uh, to, to pull in, in in one direction. Uh, so with that, chair, um, uh, we've gone slightly over time, and, um, and that, that's the story from from my side. I'm not sure whether the um, the colleague from 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 the agency is is still. Is still available, um, or is this the closure? But um, yeah, Slengi, can you advise? Yes, Mr. Luvuyo Wangazi is going to do the closing remarks. Thank you. So that's it from the WRC. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much to to all the participants. Uh, thank you very much to the Water Research Commission. 
um, for being a partner in this initiative. Um, we work for the city, we, we, we implement initiatives and, and for us um, it was proper that we, we tackle this issue. We form part of the Joint Operations uh, Center in dealing with the water crisis. Uh, and, and for us, this session was about expanding, you know, input, but also understanding best practice. Collaborative approach uh, in dealing with this issue. Uh, and we, we, we thank you that with all the submissions made, um, we will uh, have this work um, throughout this conversation, uh, which started earlier. We've had audiences in Nelson Mandela Bay um, from almost one of the major radio stations. Um, the radio stations um, such as Kubela FM, people are listening through those radio stations as we speak. We, we thank we thank you for all, you know thank you all for the participation, but we also want to reiterate uh, this is a collective effort. Um, the city alone uh, cannot do it. Um, users alone cannot. Uh, Residents, as business, uh, and on all stakeholders at various government, you know, government um, uh, levels. Uh, only then we can we can resolve this issue as a city. And uh, and with those words, um, I say, you know, from the MBDA, the management team of the MBDA, um, we do thank you for for your time. We thank you for your inputs, and may you have a, a blessed day going forward. Thank you very. Thank you very much. Uh, this event is urgent. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye. Bye.